What's up, guys? It's yo boy Omnisensei back with Reborn in Naruto as a Bito Ichiha. Part 5. If you enjoy my content, consider subscribing to the channel. Like the video, share, and leave a comment. This really helps with the algorithm. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. Also, I have set up a Patreon account, consider joining to support the channel, and for more exclusive content. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Arachimaru was outright confused as to where the mad clan of Mangrove went. He was called back to Kanoha for two weeks by his sensei, and in this short time, the whole clan vanished. And not even that, should I ask the snakes to track the clan Arachimaru shook his head. No, that might create more problems. The snake san and clicked his tongue. He didn't want to involve the snake summons into the mix. He didn't know why, but he had a hunch that would bring more problems than solutions. But where did the whole clan go what was even weird, the place where the Chidoku clan was located was blown up. No structure stood there, everything was burned to crisp, leaving no tracks for him to follow. It all pointed to them being dead. But all of the burn patterns were unique, it wasn't the usual fire release no, it looked more like a mix of fire and earth release. And there was only one shinobi in the world right now that was famous for using lava release. And that was Senator Goku. But why would that mad hermit attack a place between the border of Konoha and Mist? Even though Iwa hated Mist for both of their cages dying in each other's hands, this was just unconventional. Also, some of the attacks didn't look like it came for lava release. They were vast and looked like someone used hundreds of explosion seals at once in a sink. That was also quite impossible. Unless of course one of Iwa's shinobis known for their explosion release did it. All of the evidence painted a picture of some Iwa Shinobis for Explosion Corps, along with Senator Goku fighting Mist Shinobis. But that left one question unanswered. The Chidoku clan wasn't a part of the Mist. And why was there a Mist camp here? Several other questions ran through his head. Someone might have planted false pieces of evidence here, but that was even more unlikely. Arachimaru sensed other Shinobis come here, so quickly left. It seemed that the Mist had dispatched some of their Shinobis for investigation as well. Making it harder for him to look through all of the evidence. Why can't things be simple? And he didn't want to show himself either. The Mist would take it as an opportunity to blame the attack on him, and the war might start thing way. Arachimaru knew one old Warhawk that would love that. That made the Snake Sanin frown, was Danzo behind it he wouldn't put the Mist on me to start a war, would he? No even for him that's crazy. That would mean Kanoha have to fight all other four villages by itself. Danzo wouldn't be that stupid. And the Roots didn't have resources enough to pull strings in both Iwa and Mist to attack him. So it made it even harder for him to come to a conclusion as to what happened. Arachimaru in his quest for immortality, searched all of the elemental nations for suitable test subjects. His main interest was the different bloodline abilities. Arachimaru who was from a regular background saw firsthand how powerful planned Shinobis were. He prided in his strength, but even he had to admit the perks given by the Kakei Genkai users were quite amazing. So after participating in the second war he started doing research on them. What if he could incorporate other bloodline capabilities in himself? What if he could use those abilities to extend his life? And that's why most of the time when he wasn't researching in his laboratory, he would travel the elemental nations to find any suitable abilities for him to research on. Judoku clan was one of the random encounters. They had the ability to transform their bodies into mad beasts, boosting their battle powers and chakra and even giving them some regenerative abilities. The snake Sanin was fascinated by the regenerative aspect of it. He was given Hashirama cells recently by Danzo. The first Hokage of Konoha had some wild regenerative abilities, but none of his clan members acquired such abilities. Not even Tsunade, even though she was the direct granddaughter of Hashirama. Danzo wanted to acquire the powers possessed by Hashirama. And had made sure to supply Arachimaru with test subjects to graft the newly acquired Hashirama cells onto them to copy his ability. So when Arachimaru stumbled on the Chudoku clan, he forcefully took one of its members. He actually took two members, but one of them went mad before Orochimaru could start doing any advanced research on it. 
but the other one survived and showed much potential. Ryochudoku was his name, he was quite strong, and showed him regenerative skills when he attacked him. So he quickly caught him for research purposes. He wanted to know if there were any commonalities in them. And to his surprise there was. Hashirama cells drafted to any other human being worked like a leech, it granted them enormous vitality, chakra, and strength, but killed them in a few days. The same thing happened when he took some skin off from the Ryochudoku and transplanted it into other humans. So Orochimaru had the grand idea of mixing some Hashirama cells to some of Ryo's cells. And to his surprise, they almost had a perfect match. That made the snake Sanin think. And he had come up with a wild guess. He looked through his storage room to find a single bloody kunai. The blood was none other than Jiraiya, one of his teammates. It was taken recently by the roots when Jiraiya fraught off some shinobus in his sage mode. Never did Orochimaru expect that his teammate, that was less talented than him, would acquire such legendary powers. So had kept the bloodied kunai given to him by the roots for research purposes. The snake Sanin quickly took the blood sample and matched it with Ryo's and Hashirma's. They were compatible yet again. Their genome sequence and DNA were vastly different, and yet the cells made a symbiotic relation to each other when they were charged with chakra. It was unhurt off. Hashirama was from the Senju clan, having no connection to the Chudoku clan. And Jurera was a clanless shinobi like him. Then Orochimaru found one commonality in them. And one thing stood out, both Hashirama and Jirai were sages. Did that mean the Chudoku clan had some connection with Sinjutsu? Even though Orochimaru was the snake summoner, he wasn't even invited to their home Ryuchi cave. And he had been their summoner for almost two decades now. He needed to find his way there if he wanted to. And that was much easier said than done. But he knew that the snakes could also use Sinjutsu. So he connected all the dots and did some research on the snakes. And to his surprise, he had found what he was looking for in the Chudoku clan. But now the whole clan had vanished into thin air without leaving a trace. Were all of them killed? Less likely, the lava release or what it seemed had buried everything even the bones of the clan. But that didn't mean, Iwa couldn't keep some clan members for themselves. Especially after doing something similar to the Hayugas not too long ago. Mist could have also taken some of them inside for research as well. The clan's abilities were quite interesting. He found some Mist Shinobus battle gear in the forest, and the burnt marks and explosion suggested that Iwa attacked. So they might have something to do it. For now that was where the snake Sanin would look. For now, he couldn't go to Iwa or Mist for info gathering. Hiruzen had called him for the Chunin exams, but after that, he would go there for information gathering. What the snake Sanin didn't know was that he would be chasing a lost goose in the wrong direction for months without knowing. Danzo Shimura had ambitions, even with how much he thrived for the position of the Hokage. His main ambition was always for the village, for what is the Hokage if Konoha wasn't prospering. It was in a way being true to himself. He always thought of Konoha first, before acting. And now that the third was coming forward, he had to act. Konoha was in a rough position because of the politics of the daimyo. Unlike the Second Shinobi War where Kanoha had declared war against Kumo and the other villages. This couldn't be done now. All the years of publicizing Kanoha as one of the peace-loving nations by Hiruzen had done Kanoha a lot of favors. Gaining the trust of other daimyos, having a stable source of missions from other villages, and even earning favors from other minor villages. Danzo might not see eye to eye with Hiruzen on many things, but building up Kanoha's reputation as a peace-loving country had brought many benefits. And even he couldn't deny that. Kanoha became a hub for the other daimyos to send missions, even when they could give the missions their own villages. They chose not to normal people that didn't dabble in shinobi arts were skeptical about shinobi. It was always the case. Before the five major villages were established, shinobis were always hired for war, mercenary or assassination. But now things were quite different. But still, civilians liked to hold on to their beliefs. And it was just that most wealthy daimyos were civilians and wanted to have the upper hand over the five major nations. A foolish endeavor. And because of Kanoha's reputation, they wanted to keep a good connection with it. Because for all it's worth, daimyos were just puppet rulers. They had wealth, but they had no power, in front of a village cage. Could be killed by even the genin holding a kunai. So they wanted to have their escape routes craved out in Kanoha. And it was all good. Except now. 
Now that Kanoha had an established reputation, it couldn't declare war on other countries. Even in the Second Shinobi War, Hiruzen was able to declare war on Kumo because they killed Tabarama Senju, the second Hokage. They received backlash. It was Kinkao and Ginkaku who attacked Tabarama and killed him. But those with enough knowledge about Kumo politics would know that it was planned. Yet the Lightning Daimyo and Fire Daimyo thought of the war as unjustly putting trouble over Kumo. Morons they were. It was also good that they were so easy to manipulate. Kumo took advantage of it at the second war, but Danzo was going to use it in the third war. Now Kanoha was in a bad position, Kanoha could actively declare war without running their reputation. Yet Kanoha borders were always being bombarded with foreign shinobis from major villages. Each day, several shinobis of Kanoha would die in border duty, it was going out of hand now. They didn't want land anymore, they just wanted to do damage in the land of fire before leaving, making Kanoha weaker. Day by day. And Danzo wouldn't stand that. Kanoha wasn't militarily weak or anything. In fact, if you add every shinobi up, Danzo was confident that Kanoha could conquer all of the elemental nations, even without losing half of its military force. Kanoha had always been blessed with such talents. That was why Danzo created such a scenario where the other villages would declare war on Kanoha. Specifically, he wanted to make Mist declare war on Kanoha. And after that as a domino effect, Mist's archenemy Iwa would join in. Sand and Kumo would wait first, but Danzo will make it so they get dragged to the war along the way. Planting false info and infighting between other villages was quite easy, now that he had his roots. That way Kanoha would be hailed as being a peace-loving nation that only wants to protect its freedom from invaders. And the Hidden Mist would lose more of its face after being defeated in war. And same for the other countries. Danzo had planted root spies in Mist long ago. And it seemed that the third Mizukage had ill intentions toward the clans living there. While clans were powerful weapons for a village, they also had many problems. Such as uniting under one leader. Each clan wanted its members to become the cage. But at the same time, the numbers of clanless shinobis were always more than planned once. It wasn't that much different in Kanoha. And Danzo capitalized that, he had sparked many rumors and fights between the civilian shinobis and clan shinobis. Planted false info and evidence for each side to blame the others. And they were in quite a rough situation. So Danzo capitalized on that yet again, he had brought Orochimaru into the mix without the boy even knowing. Orochimaru wanted power, even wanted to be Hokage. And he saw nothing wrong in that, in fact, he helped him quite a bit with his roots providing him with research materials, and in making forbidden jutsus. But for his plan to work, Danzo needed to set up a bait, and Orochimaru fitted that criteria just fine, as him having a such close relationship with Hiruzen. Danzo planted false information in the Yuki clan and Hazuki clan about Orochimaru's whereabouts. In the land of Mangrove, where he was researching on a minor clan about their Kik Genkai. And the Yuki clan and Hazuki clan had quite strong fighters in their ranks, and had falsely made up a mission to go there. They wanted to kill Orochimaru and gain fame. Well Danzo wanted the opposite. Danzo knew the snake Sanin, he was young but was one of the strongest in Kanoha. He knew that Orochimaru would win the battle, and won't leave anyone behind. He was one of the cruel ones. And Danzo was betting on it. And what would that do you might ask? Simple, the Yuki and the Hazuki clan would be enraged when they hear their best shinobis being slaughtered in fighting one of the Hokage's disciple. It would make the civilian shinobis mock both of the clans, and it would rough their inner relation even more. Of course, after that, they would pressure their Mizukage to declare war, or face a civil war instead. And of course, that damn fool would choose the easy way out, and declare war. But all of his plans were ruined. The first problem came when Hiruzen sent for Orochimaru to come back to Kanoha, due to preparation for the Chunin exams. Making him miss the Mist Shinobis, and not only that. Someone had actually killed the whole Anbu forces without revealing his identity. That wasn't good. The Mist Shinobis were as confused as Danzo was. Who was this unknown player? Was someone that strong present in the Chudoku clan that Orochimaru was researching on? Least likely, but then who? Whose side was this unknown shinobi on? Anzo had learned from the previous war to not look away from unknown shinobis who held a lot of strength. Hanzo was a similar case. When Hiruzen was appointed to Hokage, Hanzo was no more than a mere shinobi wanting to get hold of the rain village. 
And yet this man single-handedly stopped the three Sanans. It was impossible to think he would get this strong. So Danzo was a bit worried. It would be better if I take steps early. The Mist Shinobi being wiped out could have been done by a group rather than a single person. Yet he had a hunch that it was a one-man job. So he wanted to be careful. And not only that after investigating a bit, the attack pattern almost matched Son Goku of the Four Tails. The burn marks looked similar to lava release, while others looked like explosion release. But that wouldn't be possible. That Iwa Shinobi was living in seclusion in Iwa. And it just happened a few of the root shinobi were there in Iwa, near the Four Tails Jinchuriki. So if he didn't attack the Mist Shinobis, it could only mean there was another lava release user. And Danzo had spies inside the Iwa's explosion core as well. They weren't even near that area. It also made him realize that someone had planted false information. They wanted to break the alliance between Iwa and Mist. Good. But they wouldn't declare war on each other just for this small act. So his plans needed adjusting. But that didn't change much. Hound Danzo called, sitting in his root headquarters. Yes master. A man came not too long after, kneeling deeply in front of him. Danzo tossed him a scroll. Which the man caught without making eye contact. Make sure the job is done. Yes, master and the shinobi disappeared into thin air. Danzo hummed, he didn't want to do it. Arachimaru would be mad, and he would need to throw a few bones to clam the snake dog down. But it will be worth it. The mission he gave to the root shinobi was simple. Mist was already suspecting Iwa for the attack, but they did send scouts to secure the area. So Danzo sent one of his best root shinobis to take down all the Mist scouts. Plant false evidence that Arachimaru had something to do with capturing and killing the Mist scout shinobis. This should be enough to make Mist declare war. Though, they might do a bit of digging into the matter first. No problem, it wasn't like he didn't have other cards in his hand. Filling the third Mizukage or the third Kazukage by his root assassination, should be enough to make a few patriots declare war on Konoha. Danzo didn't want to go this route as after doing so, the villages might tame down rather than declare war. But hmm, I don't need to kill the Kazukage. Just sending Sakumo to the sand those bastards might just get irritated enough to start the war. But would here is in let me know matter it's time to pull some favors. The war must happen. And with Hiruzen being the man in front. No daimyo would ever believe that Kanoha had anything to start the war. They would just blame their own shinobi village wanting to gain more power. How predictable. Sometimes it was hard to believe how easy it was to manipulate others. But it just made his job easy for he was the shadow of Kanoha, acting from the dark, so that Kanoha could rise in the sun. Oh, Abito you are back. The sweet shop owner said, when he saw Abito. Did the mission go well? He asked with a smile, from his outfit one could guess he was in Acheha. The usual high-collar shirt with the Acheha symbol in the back. Abito gave him a thumbs up. It was easy as a pie. The man chuckled, of course, it would be for an oddball like you. He said, before tossing him a chocolate bar to him. Enjoy your day then kid. Abito gave him a toothy smile. Right back at the Achiha respected the strong, but most talented kids tended to be far more reserved and quiet, unlike him who was always trying to lift up the mood. So other Achihas found him more approachable. And Abito of course like it. Who doesn't like attention and being genuinely cared for? There was a reason why he loved his clan, even with their perky attitude. I am home Abito said, entering his house. After dealing with so much, he actually missed his home. The Chudoku clan, killing Mist Shinobis, getting fatally injured all of it was quite mentally draining. Not to mention the fact that he was still running on three days of almost no sleep. An old lady with a full head of white hair, came down from the stars as Abito entered. Oh, Abito you are back. Granny Mai asked, looking a bit worried. What took you so long, didn't you tell me that you would come back in a week Abito didn't say anything, just smiled, before hugging the old woman. His grandma really was worried. Yes yes my lady. I also missed you. Abito said, he genuinely missed her. With all of the things going on, having people that truly care about you was such a blessing. Oh, my just don't be late next time. Granny Mai just sighed, hugging the child back. I won't be late next time. It's cause I was weak that's why I couldn't finish things earlier. You and your training. Do you ever think anything other than that? Abito separated from the hug, grinning back with full teeth. Of course, I think about you, my lady. 
Granny Mai rolled her eyes. I'm not the one you should be thinking about at your age. You should be thinking about girls your age right now. Abito blinked, making a blank face. I'm not even 10. What were you even doing back at that age? The old lady started walking away from him. At your age, I was already getting out of the clan meeting with a certain Acheha. But you wouldn't know that being boring and all. Truly your grandfather's good looks were wasted on you. Abito's jaw almost dropped to the floor. Well, it's official while his grandparents were insane. Falling in love that early. But then again weren't Hashirama and Madara also secretly friends back at age. Hum, I will get something ready for you to eat. Granny Mai said, breaking out Abito out of his thoughts. Anything you want. Meat. Gotta have my protein. Well, 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 what do we have here? A person said, making Shisui flinch and jump forward with his kunai out. The boy blinked when he looked up to see who it was. It was Abito, with his usual carefree grin, sticking upside down in the three. Big bro you are back, Shisui said in a cheerful tone. Before he frowned, making a single hand sign with both of his fingers. Release. And the illusion shattered and Abito on the tree was no more. Well, aren't you getting better, Abito said, sitting on a rock casually eating a dango. Hearing Abito praise him, Shisui puffed his chest with a little bit of pride. But you were still weak. And would get your head chopped with those skills. Shisui deflated like a balloon. You're mean big bro. Don't be too hard on yourself, Abito said in a playful manner. As if he wasn't the one being hard on him. But then again, it was how you should train in a chiha, never let them get their ego get to their head. Their ego and superiority complex should be beaten out of them before they even mature to a shinobi. Only then can they truly learn from their mistakes. But if you consider Shisui's skills, then he's quite good. Shisui is what, five and a half, and yet he is more skilled than Kakashi at his age. Well, it should be that way, Abito had been training him since he was three. And Abito prided on it. Heck, Shisui was the closest thing to a little brother he had. Abito tossed Shisui one of the dangos. Here, have some. Ah uh, thanks. The boy said as he took it. Before he glanced at Abito from time to time. Abito noticed it, you wanna say something? Um I want to join the academy. Shisui said, as he walked near Abito. I think I'm skilled enough. Abito rolled his eyes, yes, of course, you will think that. Who inflated your ego this time? Shisui bit his lips. No one Abito chuckled. Well, sorry to say mister. Unless I tell you, you can't join the academy. Not even the Hokage can set you up on that. Shisui whined. But why cause you too weak? Abido said in a playful way, flicking the dango stick right between Shisui's eyes. The boy was again too slow to stop it. The boy didn't expect that. Ow, see dead Abido mused. It seemed to annoy the boy even more. But fine you are just mean, big bro. Shisui said, pouting. Oh, he looked so cute when he was angry. Actually, Shisui had the skills to not only join the academy, but graduated in a week. Not only his skills as a shinobi, but Shisui was also a natural sensor, good at almost all shinobi arts, and had a good head on his shoulders. He could do it easily. But Abito didn't want Shisui to join the academy. Not until the third war finished or it was in a favorable position for Konoha. Abido didn't know what the canon Shisui was doing in the Third Shinobi War. But if Shisui graduates, like the canon Genin squads will be pulled into the war to cover the battlefield. Tabarama created the Shinobi Academy, so that no unskilled Shinobi could join the ranks, unless they were Chunin. It was to prevent unnecessary casualty for children. Asarama and Madara did create the village, so that no child. if he was not wrong, then out of the four major villages. Three of them were fighting against Konoha. Kumo caused A and Killer B to attack Minato. Iwa caused they sent thousands of Shinobis to get slaughtered, so, that was the reason why Abito didn't want Shisui to get tangled up in the war. There was no need for accidents to happen. But Shisui was no as as free-spirited as Abito. So he wanted to explore the outside of Konoha. So it was quite depressing that he couldn't do that, being a child and all. Abito looked at Shisui. Um, but then again I was thinking of giving you some water and wind release training, but... Never mind. Shisui's ears perked up. Wait what did you say you will teach me wind and water release? He asked with stars in his eyes. Abito tried not to chuckle. It seemed that manipulating kids were easier than manipulating Anbu-level Shinobis. Who would have known? 
Oh, but I thought you wanted to get lectured by the boring instructors of the academy, Abito said, playfully. You wouldn't need me for that would you now? Shisui grabbed Abito's hand. Please teach me water and wind jutsus. Oh, come on right to business. So demanding of you. Abito said, taking out two scrolls from his shirt and handing it to Shisui. Learn to control wind and water nature at a basic level. It will help with learning the jutsus. Shisui just nodded, sitting right there on the ground and going through the scrolls. Honestly, Shisui was a monster. Having a natural talent for fire, wind, and lightning release. And even having some affinity for water release as well. And not to mention his fire release was exceptionally strong as well. It even burned his mouth from time to time. But then again in canon, Shisui would have to use Anbu level A rank water jutsu to cool off his mouth when he used fire release jutsu. Just not to get burned. After coming to this world, he had learned that only Madara and Azuna had done that kind of fire release jutsu. It spoke volumes about Shisui's talent. In the original series, he was more like a legendary figure. But here, Abito would make sure to make this Shisui a legend. And it was also good that Abito didn't have to explain things too much to him. Being a talent and all, Shisui was just in another league. But then again, so was Kakashi and even Itachi. It didn't mean he would fall behind. No he just needed to outwork his competitors by a huge margin that talent won't matter anymore. Shisui looked from his scroll to Abito. But Nai-san, do you have any water jutsus? Abito blinked. This boy was sharp as well. Yeah, I liberated some scrolls and info on water release when I went on the mission. But it will be hard. I don't know water release that much, so you will have to figure it out from the scrolls yourself. But if you feel like you got stuck, ask Kashina sensei Shisui nodded getting back to reading. Abito actually did find some high-class water release jutsus after going through the memories of the Hero Hazuki's decapitated head. Retrieving info from decapitated heads was quite easy if you know the basics of Yamanaka Jutsus, and even more so, when you have the Sharingan to cast it. Not only Jutsus but summoning contracts as well. Invading an alive victim's mind was harsh, due to all the running thoughts, but a dead one was easy. And getting important Jutsus that they had to memorize and weave at a moment's notice was much easier to get. He was actually going to give some base-level Jutsus to Shisui. Abito wanted Shisui to be the next Bat Summoner. The Bat Clan was getting big, and he needed someone trustworthy to expand the clan summoning. And who better than the boy that he practically raised. Shisui's father or Kagami were quite busy with either clan-related stuff or missions. He was the only one Shisui had to train for the past years. So even though Abito wanted to make the boy learn water jutsus, he would mostly focus on teaching him wind jutsus. That way he could also use his special equipments later. He was going to play the long game. Ryuchi Cave was going to be taken, and fighting Orochimaru alone would be foolish, so why not invest on talents that he could rely his back on. Also Abito also planned to start studying the Aburam clan, and start making antidotes for it. Danzo was calm right now, being okay with how the Ichiha was doing things. But he wouldn't trust the old man, even Kagami was wary of him. And the most loyal clan near to the Shimura was the Aburam clan. Their bug user was the reason, the canon Shisui died. And who knows if he wants to cut off a few Ichihas during the war. He wouldn't be able to save all of them, but he could prepare beforehand. But that was a thing to worry about in the future. Even Danzo wouldn't do anything in the Chunin exams. But the man would surely boil in rage if he saw the Ichihas gaining fame in the exams. Anyway, back to the current things to worry about. Abito would give some of the water jutsus to Rin as well, maybe even higher ones if she proves to be useful. It might seem harsh, but for now, Rin wasn't contributing anything significant to Team Minato. Unless she can change that, Rin will have to be replaced. She was training water style and kinjutsu under Kusina, but if she doesn't improve Abito wouldn't help her much. It would be better to cut off weaklings before going to war. But if Rin can improve then he would give her the more advanced Hazuki Jutsus, and even try to get their summoning scroll. The Clam Clan was very much trusting of the Hazuki Clan. But that didn't mean they wouldn't take other summoners. He would of course need to check things through, but it would be better this way. If that wasn't that, he could of course venture with the bats into their summoning realm to capture some of their special water. That water was an emergency trump card. And of course he wanted that. 
Unlike other teams, Abito didn't want each of his teammates to contribute to a single role, like a tanker, attacker, and healer. No, he wanted all of them to be all-rounder, with specialized skills in some area. That way even if one of them could get separated from the group, he or she will be able to hold off or even fool the enemies with Jinjutsu, until the others came back. That's why getting the Clam Clan would be very good for Rin. They were very good at water style and Jinjutsu. And Kakashi was a Senju, he already knew how to defend against his Sharingan Jinjutsu, and even cast some of Tabriyama's Jinjutsu. But that would all happen if Rin doesn't disappoint him. If she does, then he would make sure she's out of the team. The girl would be better off living here in Konoha, rather than dying in war. No need to be the Sakura on the team. Thinking about it, it was already time. He should report to Minato as well. To polish his skills, the Chunin exams had a lot of expectations for him. And of course, he would show off there. Heck, he was wishing to kill of some future villains in making. The Chunin exams were going to be a show of the last peaceful competition between the five villages, before that, and gaining all the attention wouldn't be too bad. It wasn't like he was an attention whore or anything. Abito internally giggled, having a frail grin on his face. I will be sure to make a name for myself in the exams. Nai san why do you always smile that Shisui asked, looking a bit disturbed. Oops, was he showing off his villain-like grin again? He should really start wearing a mask right now. Things passed smoothly in Kanoha after coming back. Abito had a lot of time in hand to recuperate his mental health. And after two weeks he could finally sleep, the nightmares were still there. But he had learned to sleep through them. Abito also took this time to make contact with the Grand Lady of the Bats. And he had gone there in the land of rotten trees. The old bat wanted to show him the place where the Ryuchi cave was. And it was right there, hidden by barriers and mazes, right in the center of the land of rotten trees. An area that has almost no animal life living near it. Though the grand lady did say before the snakes took over this used to be a lively forest. Anyhow, Abito was quite a bit surprised that the Ryuchi cave would be inside the land of fire. It wasn't even that far from Kanoha. Only a few days away at shinobi speed. The grand lady after showing him that told him to not go there. He still remembered the word she said. You are still weak and showing yourself to the snakes would get you killed and expose the bat clan to the danger. The old bat had said, hanging upside down from the tree. Don't even try to get there until you are strong enough. And I will make sure of that. And she sure did. The old bat was holding on to a lot of secrets. She was purposefully not keeping key techniques from the bat. She didn't want the new generation of bats to be strong, because she didn't want any one of the new bats to get too strong and do something bold like attack the snakes. It was in a way to protect them. But after finding a beta worthy, she started to train the other bats as well. Only then did she show how terrifying the toxins of bats were. In all honesty, the bats before weren't even utilizing half of the fear toxins potential. Like the other bats, Abito also got one-on-one -on -one lesson from the old lady bat. And she was helping him develop his own secondary fear toxin ability. Similar to what Nightwing and Robin could do. Everyone that awakened their second fear toxin ability had different quirks attached to it. So Abito was also curious what he could do with it. Abito hadn't awakened his fear toxin secondary ability, but he was very eager for that. Though like everything it would take time. But that wasn't the main benefit. The main thing was getting close to her. She didn't trust the Grand Lady, for all she knew she only cared about the Bat Clan, not him. Unlike Nightwing and Robin, he couldn't trust her. And he knew she might be thinking something similar. Both in a relationship of master and student for mutual benefits. Even after the Grand Lady trained him, he wasn't that close to her yet. So he didn't directly ask for help regarding his curse mark research using the Chudoku Clan. But she seemed to be quite intrigued it was good enough for now. If Abito really couldn't make a curse seal, then he would ask for her help. He wanted to try it out himself first. He was pretty good with a few injutsu, so why not? What Abito didn't know was that the old bat was observing the senjutsu research. She still didn't reveal her abilities in using senjutsu, but wanted to see how far Abito could go without her help. The concept of a curse mark was really interesting to her, and if it could be made it would benefit the clan. And not Matino having an another sage in the bat clan would be quite beneficial. 
the old bat after learning that the snake summoner had kidnapped two of the Chudoku clan members before, went out of her way to kill the two hostages. She had to search far and wide to look for Arachimaru's base, but she found it eventually. Rather than them being tortured and experimented on, she found it more ethical to give them a quick death. Not knowing it would pause the growth of Arachimaru even further. Though it did cause quite a commotion inside the root headquarters, and Danzo and Arachimaru were searching for a traitor that didn't even exist. Abido didn't know about it, so he was just as clueless as the others. And like that time passed, and there was only one week left for the Chunin exams. Abido now was enjoying some alone time reading some complex explosion release on top of a tree. He didn't want his explosion seals failing on him, like the other time, so he was going to improve that. That was why he was going through any explosion seals he could get his hands on, Yuzumaki scrolls, Senju scrolls, and even foreign clan scrolls that had been collected by the Ichihas during war. Below Shisui was going toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of Abido's clones. Robin liked to tease the small Ichiha for some reason, and Abido let him have sparing matches with Shisui. Shisui was talented, and Robin didn't need to hold back that much fighting against him. Of course, Shisui was still an Ichiha without his Sharingan, but things would change when he gets his eyes. Though he wasn't sure how it will go. As far as he knew he awakened his eyes in or before the war. He wasn't sure. He did know that he awakened his man Jekyo because of his friend. He awakened it when he watched a dear friend and rival die after withholding his aid in a moment of envy and weakness. As far as that even took place in the war. And he wasn't going to let his little bro go to any war, not when he's around. So it will change stuff. But then again there are other methods to gaining strength. Other safer alternatives. But as this was going on, Abido suddenly stopped his work and looked down in a certain direction. Come out. He said, sighing a bit. Shisui and Robin stopped their battle and looked there as well. An Ichiha that looked a bit younger than Abido came out from behind the tree. A stoic face for a seven-year-old, with his Sharingan active. All three tomes spun impressively on the bloody eyes. Shisui and Robin stopped their battle and looked there as well. An Ichiha that looked a bit younger than Abido came out from behind the tree. A stoic face for a seven-year-old, with his Sharingan active. All three tomes spun impressively on the bloody eyes. Oh, it's Ken. What can I do for you? Do you need any pointers for your training? Abido asked, with an amused expression. And sure enough, the seven-year-old prodigy scoffed. He crossed his arms, I was just in the area, and don't overestimate yourself Abido. I also possess these eyes now. Don't even think I will be same as before. Unham Abido rolled his eyes, I don't doubt it all. Now, what might a busy Anbu Shinobi like yourself want with me? Did the clan leader call? Ken didn't say anything for a while, before shaking his head. No brother didn't call. Like I said, I was just around the area. Ken Ichiha, the younger brother of Fugaku Ichiha. A few years ago, Fugaku had taken up the ladder of the clan head after marrying Makoto Ichiha. They even had their first child, Itachi. Unlike other Ichihas Ken didn't like Abido much. Ken and Abido had taken their fire ceremony exam together, after awakening their chakra. Ken was younger than him by two years. So of course they had a competition between them. And clearly, Ken was better talented than Abido. And yet Ken never won against Abido once. It was quite simple really, well people like Ken, Shisui or even Kakashi had a talent for shinobi arts. Abido closed the gap with his talent for hard work and trickery. His unusual tactics and thinking ahead of opponents was something even uncommon in the Nara clan. That was the reason why I didn't like him that much. Ken was the embodiment of Ichiha, talented, sharp, and had a pride that could rival the young masters of the cultivation novel. That was the reason why Ken and Abido locked eyes with each other, having their sharing active. But before they could engage in a Jinjutsu battle hey, if you want to train we wouldn't mind, Shisui called, making Ken twitch looking at the smaller one. Like I would need weak-willed people like you to teach me anything. Ken said, ending it with a, HMPH. But before he left, Ken said something. Don't drag the clan's name down, by doing something stupid. If it you're all in the tune in exams, the clan has high hopes for you he said, in a way that didn't feel that motivating. And with that, he left leaving a trail of leaves in his place. Of course, all of the people that were aware of clan politics, knew that what the tune in exam was. So even though Ken was a rank above him, he didn't see it that way. 
The boy was prideful, but not arrogant. Shisui looked up at the original Abido. He doesn't like you does he? Abido just chuckled getting back to his reading. Apparently not. Unlike Abido, Ken hadn't waited and immediately graduated and now was a member of the Anbu at 7 years old. He was recruited in last year when he was Chunin. Being recruited as an Anbu when you are a Chunin level at that age was unheard of. And surely nothing like that happened in the original. This was another change that was made in this timeline. As even Itachi who joined the Anbu much later was a big deal in the clan. Hey if you both fought who would win? Shisui asked now that the other one was gone. Abido's lips curled up. Even if we fought a hundred times, he wouldn't win. I'm just that amazing. He said, of course in a humbling tone. Then again there are only a handful of people in the clan that can stop me, so he's not that bad either. Now go back to your training. The last thing I want is for you to gain an ego like him. Shisui groaned while Abido smirked glancing at a certain part of the forest. Obviously he could sense that Ken was still there. Ken, on the other hand, gritted his teeth hearing that. Just you wait I will beat that smirk off your face. He said to himself, his Sharingan spinning in rage and furry. With that, he left for real. The Chunin exams. The day had finally arrived, and the Chunin exams were being held in Kanoha. Shinobi from all the major to minor villages came to put on a show for the daimyos. Unlike the show, one shinobi could easily get promoted to Chunin by going through field promotions. Rather than going through the event, and yet the Chunin exam was like the Olympic game of this world. Having all the major countries involved in it. More so now that the threat of a future war just around the corner. Every shinobi nation wanted to get in the good graces of their daimyos before things started going wild. Even Kumo sent some of their best gen into the exam. The Chunin exam in reality was a show. So most other villages sent some of their strongest genins to it. Depending on skills and chakra some of them could even put fight against seasoned jonins. It was kind of a political power play by the villages. Abido sat on his chair, his legs resting on the table in front. With shades covering his eyes and his dark clothes made him quite stand out. Abido was this year's trump card in Kanoha. Of course, he would stand out. You are really taking your task to your heart aren't you? Rin said with a deadpan expression. As his teammate of course she was also getting the attention. That's to be expected of my rival. Guy nodded vigorously. Standing out even more with his bright green spandex. And not to mention he was actually sitting above the table rather than his given chair. Rin just sighed. Do as you please. She shook her head, rather than argue with them. She looked around to see other contenders. Judging them by looks and chakra's signature. Rin also looked different. Even though she was 9 years of age, she was wearing clothes that hid that. Actually, she had donned more of an assassin look wearing black clothes and shinobi vested clothes that looked similar to Anbu. Even wearing a face mask and a hoodie to cover her face. Though unlike Kakashi she didn't wear the face mask all the time, like now. Actually, this was something Abido had made for Rin, after she requested him to make something similar to him with a bit of modification. From afar she looked rather dangerous. Abido had seen Rin's improvement. And he was actually surprised with how far she went. And at the same time excited about his improvement. Even though he was the trump card of Kanoha. That didn't mean he would be the only one to show off. He wanted his teammates to show off just as much. Trump card, showstopper or whatever you called it. He was taking the Chunin exams for only one purpose, it was to boost Kanoha's reputation before the upcoming war. So why not do it together? And Abido like the civilized, law-abiding, loyal shinobi he was he was going to put up a grand act. Of course, he will it wasn't like he attention whore or anything. If they want a show. I will give it to them. I do have a bunch of unnecessary flashy jutsus in my arsenal already, so why not use them? Abido thought to himself, as other contestants were taking their seats. Abido over the years had learned hundreds of jutsus that wasn't very practical in shinobi combat. He even wondered why some of those jutsus were even made. It kind of reminded him of Kanon Kakashi, the master of thousand jutsus, but used only a few. The first part of the Chunin exam was going to be a written exam. It was held in a wide field, rather than in a classroom. Shinobi from all other villages were taking their seats randomly. Abido's team wasn't the only shinobi team from Kanoha. 
There were a few shinobis from the original Kanoha cast that he recognized, but didn't remember the names of all of them, or they weren't that of a challenge like Mizuki or Ruka. But in specific, a few of them stood out. That was Anko, Kurinai, Asuma, Tarifa Akimichi, the son of one of the village elders Tarifu Akimichi, and an unnamed Nara, and lastly a Hayuga. They had some aura to them, that already made them separated from others. Especially Anko, her chakra was a bit different. As if it had the properties of poison in it, it was kind of similar to Arachimaru. But different. Having summons from the same clan can really change one's properties of their chakra. There was a reason why Kakashi's chakra was similar to a wild beast, even though he was one of the most compassed ninjas he knew. It was because of his summon Akito. Anyhow, he wasn't even worried about any shinobis from his village. They were still weak, compared to him. And they wouldn't be able to make him even use his Sharingan, rather than the other hundred tricks that he kept under his sleeves. But he would try to save anyone from the village if things turned out rough for them. He would be gaining fame and at the same time gaining future allies if he did it. Also they were from his village, so of course he would give them priority. It just felt right too. Now for the enemies. Glancing at the other villages, a group from Iwa Shinobis stood out. One boy having a huge chakra reserve that he was trying to hide. Abido would have deemed him to be a Jinchiriki if he hadn't known any better. The name of the boy was Ku, the son of Anoki the third Tsuchikage. And like him, he would this years of the Stone Village. But his teammates were just as interesting. It was Dadara, the boy looked almost girlish at this age. And another bulky boy with a huge axe attached to his back. Abido had high expectations for their team. It seems I might be able to encounter the famous particle release and explosion release before the war. Poor them, and luckily me. He mused. It wasn't like he didn't know they would come this year. Hirazin had even given him all of the potential threats he might face this year. This was an unfair advantage, but who cared about those sort of things in front of a bloody war? He was the only one who gained access to that info. As not even his teammates knew about it. It also showed that Hirazin favored him, as the the elders in clan were getting their hopes high for an Achiha Hokage. Fugaku was even entertaining the idea. Of course the clan elders were getting wet dreams because of it. Those bastards, trying to curse him with paperwork. Well, sorry to say Fugaku, I will make your son take the hat. Abito thought. Poor Itachi. He will be turned to a paperwork slayer in this world, rather than the kin slayer. The Achiha mused. Abito looked over the Iwa team once more. Anyway, now they were his targets. And would be hunted down, rightfully so. Though, he couldn't kill some of them in the second stage, as it might cut off entertainment for the third stage of the exam. For example, it would be good to face off against the son of Tsuchikage in the third round of the exam. Where it will be in front of an audience. It would of course make for a wonderful show. He was sure he would be put against him if the boy cleared the second stage. But for people like Dadara, it would be better to finish him off earlier. No need for him to be alive. There was another team of Iowa, but they didn't have any exceptions. The said blonde boy suddenly felt a shiver run down his spine. He looked around but didn't find anything other than the participants. Abido turned his focus to another team of the mist. Would you look at that Kissam and Zabuza on the same team Abido smirked under his high collar. There was another Hazuki on the team, but Abido didn't recognize him. Kissam and Zabuza both held large broad swords in their backs. And sure enough, Kissam had a huge chakra reserve even when he was a kid. Abido shifted his attention elsewhere, it was the sand team. There wasn't anyone strong in their group. The village had suffered a huge loss after fighting against Kanoha in the last war. Betting a lot of their shinobis killed by the hands of Sukumo Haddock. It seemed that they were being cautious and only sent teams with relative strength. But one of the female contests of Suna stood out. It wasn't her appearance, but her chakra. It seemed different from the others. An elemental Kik Genkai probably. Anyhow Kumo sent a strong team to represent them. And Abido recognized each one of them. Derui, Samui and Yujido Nai. The girl having all the signs of a Jinchiriki. Ha, huh, unlike him, other sensors couldn't peek out the signs of a Jinchiriki. Just that they had a lot of chakra. Maybe Minato could. Abido could because of him spending a large amount of time with Kashina. Having two chakra signatures, twisting in a symbiotic fashion, was easily recognized by him. And as far as he knew, not even the files he was given had any info related to Biju on her. 
before the exam. Abito was given almost all of the information Kanoha had on other contestants, except the Shinobis from his village. And even though Hiruzen was the one who gave it to him, it was actually Danzo's idea. The village elder was present at the time when he gave the file to Abito. And of course, he showed interest in him, and even offered Abito to join his Anbu team. Abito flat out rejected him. Saying that he wouldn't even join Kagami's team. And would make his own team. Hiruzen liked the prospect and even questioned some of the details. While well, Danzo proposed something even bolder, wanting to appoint a few of the root members to Abito's future team to show him the ropes. Danzo planned on setting at least one mole in his future Anbu team. But Abito didn't mind though. Danzo had an eye for talent, and Abito had an eye for charm. All Abito had to do is change their loyalties to Abito. Or just kill them with an unfortunate accident. Danzo for his part did everything for the village. Or at least he tried to. Even though the majority of his actions spoke otherwise and reflected his whims on how things should go, according to him. There was one fact about Danzo's character that he liked when he was back in the real world. The Shimura was a constant evil. He wasn't some beat-up villain to change his ideology, just by getting his ass beat up. He was as evil as they came. But at the same time, Hiruzen deemed him to be the necessary evil. A foolish decision, but Abito couldn't do anything about it for now. Anyhow, Abito was going to represent Kanoha in this exam. It was the first time anyone from the Achiha clan was the main player of Kanoha. But even with the enmity, Danzo held for the clan, he didn't discriminate. And gave any info his own root team collected on through the spies he set up in other villages. That day Abito also knew that Danzo and even Hiruzen expected much from Abito. Even sharing some massive secrets to him, showing him that they trusted him. Of course, it was a plain old carrot and stick tactic. But Abito played along. He already knew that Kanoha had wide webs of shinobi spies around the enemy nations. Root wasn't a separate part of Anbu like it was in the series. They were just Danzo's team members handpicked by him. Tsukumo and even Kagami had similar teams, though they weren't as big as Danzo's. More important missions that were ranked A class or S class were taken by them, rather than the stranded Kanoha team. Anyhow, when Abito read the file on Yujito Nai, it made him see that the Roots or anyone in Kanoha for that matter, knew about her being a Jinchuriki. That was good in a way. Unlike the son of Tsuchikage, killing her and taking her Biju for himself, would give him massive benefits. And Kumo wouldn't be able to even blame them. Or rather wouldn't dare to accuse them cause of the upcoming war, it would only show weakness. And they cancelling their Chunin exams was also a very big thing that happened this year. Not to mention Kanoha was in its golden era now. Kanoha had all the shinobis from the original and even more, such as Sakumo and Kagami. So he should be fine if he did something bold with it. Abito shook his head. Taking the two tails for himself would actually solve a lot of problems. But even then, the two tails was too weak. He wanted someone stronger. And Yujito Nai might have even bonded well with the Biju, so taking her life would mean gaining the distrust of the Biju. Being a perfect Jinchuriki was easier said than done. He wanted a comrade he could show his back to, not a slave battery. The Bat Clan had shown him the advantage of having comrades, rather than doing everything alone. So he wouldn't do that. But killing her would make the Chakra Ghost Biju appear elsewhere. Maybe spawn near Kanoha after a few years. So should he just kill her? Hmm it seems she would also be one of the unlucky ones. Abito sighed, the Shinobi War was too cruel. Yujito Nai was still a child of 12 years of age. Most of them were. But the kid might die, cause of just being at the village at the wrong time, targeted by the wrong person. But then again would his future enemies show mercy to his friends. No so he wouldn't either. Abito also found a few light bulb chakra signatures from a team from Yuzumaki. Their chakra almost matched Kakashi's. But as allies, he wouldn't even touch them, rather would like to have a talk with them after the exams. Now that the third shinobi war was on its way, there was no way he could sit still. So after the exam, he intended to have a talk with Kishina and Mido. It was surprising that the old Jinchuriki was still alive, even after the Biju was extracted so many years ago. But it worked for his benefit. Sealing arts was a long tradition. Every new seal was a modification of the previous works done by the others. As Abito now was researching on Jugo's clan he found it quite appreciative. Abito's chain of thought was cut off when three examiners suddenly appeared on the stage with green leaves flying around them. 
Finally, I was getting bored here. Anko said. The girl had taken up a seat near to Rin. They being friends back at the academy, with her teammate sitting near her. Abito and Guy also sat properly, now that the exam was starting. Now we will begin the first stage of the Chunin exam. The main examiner said and it was Nara. Please take your seats. The question papers will be given shortly. Hey guys, you know the drill. Abito reminded his teammate as the exam started. There wasn't exceptionally exiting about the written exam. Abito had already told Rin and Guy to not quit. And he would take care of exam, even if they submitted blank papers. So the first stage of the Chunin exam ended, after almost half of the Genins were disqualified. It was mostly to reduce the numbers. Abito found it quite easy to gather information with his Sharingan and his bat summons. But he was a little disappointed that he couldn't show off. But then again the second part of the Chunin exams was bound to be amazing. For those, he kept up with the Shinobi events, and knew all three parts of the Chunin exams were mostly the same with minor changes. Congratulations to all the wimps that passed the exam. Now the second part of the exam will be held. So do your best to survive. The main examiner said, of course by his tattoos and fangs, one could guess he was from the Inuzuka clan. He grinned one last time before going away with the body flicker. The moment he went away, with a poof a man entered appeared on the platform. And a feeling of dread came along with it. It's sensei. Anko called out, prompting Abito to look at Arachimaru. The snake man was the protector for the second exam. And seeing one of the Sanin, brought quite a bit of chatter among the contestants. He was a legendary figure. But the snake Sanin didn't like the attention that much. And seemed rather annoyed for some reason. Huh, wonder why. I will be the protector for the next exam. The man said, releasing an absurd amount of killing intent just for the sake of it. And sure enough, it quieted down the chatter. Heck, some even lost consciousness because of it. Now follow me to the forest of death. With that he started jumping from one tree to another. Abito didn't find it hard, but his fellow genins were sweating bullets. So he was the first one to move, following along with Arachimaru. And seeing him, the others started to follow as well. Abito's teammates were also the first to recover, and followed him. And with that, they were at the entrance of the Forest of Death. After the bats made their cave inside the forest, it was the first time that an exam was being held so close to their home. Abito was a bit worried when it happened. The bats were amazing at stealth, not even the Byakugan could see them if they wanted to hide. But Sinjutsu users such as Minato and Jiraiya were an odd case. And also there was Kagami, he also was somehow able to see his bats. But the Grand Lady of the Bats had made seals that should protect their homes from any Sinjutsu users from noticing. It made him assured a bit. He didn't know if it could block Kagami from noticing. But he had faith in the Crow Summoner, he was his teacher for almost four years. The man was the closet thing to a father he had, so of course he wasn't worried about him. Though it would be better if he didn't find it. In theory, now that the exam was being held here, Abito could collect foreign genins to experiment with them. Even with Guy and Rin tagging along with him. He could easily switch himself with a clone. But just to be safe, he wasn't going to do anything like that. There weren't that many interesting bloodlines that he could experiment on. And had quite enough work cut out for him. But then again he might change his mind depending on the circumstances. Arachimaru spoke after seeing the genins gather, Three-man teams will be given either a Heaven Scroll or an Earth Scroll before entering the forest. They then have five days for the entire team to reach the building in the center of the forest, with one of each scroll in their possession. How they acquire the other scroll is up to you to decide. As long as you bring back one of each scroll your team will pass the second stage. He held out his scroll in his hand. Because of the natural hazards of the forest, the absence of services or outside assistance, and the likely conflict with other teams, Genin must sign liability waivers before entering to release Kanoha from responsibility for any injuries or deaths. Any questions? The Genins looked at the snake Sanin with a bit of fear, and no one asked any questions. With that, the second stage of the exam started. Abido and his team were given the Earth Scroll with it, they started moving into the forest of death. They weren't the first team, many teams were already ahead of them because they started early. But that didn't matter that much. Abido was going to stay the full five days duration of the exam here anyway. He of course planned to finish the exam by the end of the day, but nobody said he had to stay there. 
Guys, let's finish the exam early, Abito called out. Yosh. My friend, let's finish the exam before night. Guy called out, having the fire of youth around him. Or what Rin liked to call it, youth jinjutsu. If I can't I will run a hundred laps around the village carrying a huge boulder above my head. Rin squinted her eyes and imagined, Guy, running like that. That shit would scare anyone. Yeah, no. You won't do such a thing while you are in the team. It will ruin the team's reputation. She said, as she easily kept up with Abito and Guy. Abito and Guy weren't giving it their all. But that was above Chunin running speed. But after training with Kashina, she found running like that quite easy. It just showed that she had improved. I agree with Rin on this one. Abito blankly stated. Though, we need to get one heaven scroll first. Yes, my friend. Guy said, before charging Chakra up. Then let's defeat the enemy in hand. Dynamic entry. But that guy disappeared from his spot, his feet smashing a nearby tree. Breaking a good chunk of it and creating a dust cloud. When the dust cleared guy was standing over a knocked out shinobi. A shinobi wearing a mist headband. Shit they got Taki two other shinobi came out of their hiding throwing shuriken and kunai at guy. At least a dozen of them were making their way to guy, who just stood there with a dazzling set of white teeth smiling. Don't worry they are just kids. One of them said. It was true, even though it was a genin exam, there were shinobis up to 20 years old to little as 9 years old participating. All of the Miss team members themselves were around 15, almost double their age. But before the kunais and shuriken could reach Guy. Two shurikens came from the side and bounced off each other then to the enemy kunai and shuriken. Blocking all of them from reaching Guy. Yeah, you guys have bad luck. Abito boringly said, making a pulling motion, and the two shurikens got back to him like a yo-yo. The other two shinobi looked at both Guy and Abito with a sense of distress. Both of them looked bored. As if they weren't a challenge. Don't underestimate us, you bastard. One of the missed shinobi growled, with shark-like teeth. He ran towards Abito who was nearest to him with his dual swords out. Wait. The other one tried to stop him, whereas the third one he couldn't finish his sentence when he suddenly felt pain in the back of his head and lost conciseness. Rin stood right behind her with her sheathed sword. The foolish missed shinobi that launched towards Abito, slashed his two blades when he got near Abito. The Achiha didn't even spread his two hands to his side. While two swords hit his hands. And yet the Miss Genin was wide-eyed when rather than blood and flesh, he saw his blades breaking. The Miss Genin was wide-eyed and quickly jumped back. You you what are you? Me. I'm Mario. He said in a high-pitched voice. What but then the Miss Shinobi noticed his other teammate is nowhere. Where's oh, he's dead right over there, Abito said, boringly pointing at where Rin was couching down at the Miss Shinobi looting him. Well, he wasn't actually dead. But the other party didn't know that. You you won't get away with this. The mist kid said, his voice laced with fear and fake bravado. Do you know who my uncle is? He's one of the seven swordsmen of the mist. I can get all of your names in the bingo book and you will be hunted for the rest of your life. Really? Abito blinked. I would really like that, actually. Bingo book is like the bounty poster of this world, so why wouldn't I? So what will I have to do? skin you alive or painlessly behead you. I mean your village is even weaker than our allies Yuzumaki village. You really think we care about your petty threats? Seeing no other way, the mist shinobi looked at Rin who was looting his teammate. And threw two explosive kunais at her. But alas it didn't reach her, getting caught by two shurikens, blowing just empty air. You let your guard down, Abito smiled as he stood very close to the mist shinobi, his left leg, back in a kicking position. A nasty feeling the mist shinobi felt. Tabarama sends you secret arts. Kick breaking balls. The 15 year old boy couldn't even shout, as his eyes turned back to his head due to the foul attack, and he fell down. Abido quickly caught the mist shinobi before he could fall off the tree and die. He broke his balls anyway, no need to kill him. He wasn't that cruel. Guy seeing the attack, quickly guarded his crouch. That's a foul attack Abido. The poor boy and his balls. Hey, but he attacked first, Abito said defensively, the 15-year-old missed now on the tree branch. Well, we didn't kill any of them. And I'm sure they wouldn't be that merciful to us either. So it's fair game for me. No, but that's unfair. I tell you. 
Rin just sighed, not even bothering to stop them, as he started looting the enemy for the scroll or anything valuable. Abita looked at the scroll and sighed. An earth scroll. We already have that one Rin nodded. Then what should we do burn it? Why would you do that? I asked. Cause it will remove one team that passes the exam if there is one less scroll. Abito said, but no I would recommend that we keep it, we might be able to exchange it later with a lucky team. She nodded, and with that, all of them started heading towards the forest again. Of course, animals tried to attack. Almost all of the animals were drugged to make the exam difficult for the genins. As days pass the effects will go off, but as this was the first day, even the fearful raccoons would attack anyone that was near. Of course, the said raccoons being equal to the size of a bear. They were of course all chakra beasts. Huge in size, being able to use stupidly enhanced strength and stuff. But for his team, it was easy as a breeze. Rin wanted to take the lead to clear out any frontline attackers. And she did the job just fine, killing any animals or birds that came down attacking. But her self-estimate was still low, that's why she was still trying to prove herself to everyone. And that was a burden she needed to overcome. But for now, he would let it be. You really are doing quite fine, Rin. With that I don't think becoming the best Kanoichi of Kanoha wouldn't be too tough for you. Abito said, motivating her might help a bit. I agree, my friend. I can see the burning passion of youth in you. Rin didn't say anything, but from side, he could clearly see the facial muscles move in a way that would show a smile. He really got good at reading people after awakening and mastering the Sharingan, so for stuff like this, he didn't even need it anymore. As they speed up, Abito picked up a few signatures and suggested that they go that way. As they got near they started hearing sounds of explosion and chaos. There was a battle going on. So they moved a bit slow, keeping the stealth up high. Let's observe first, Abito whispered, while his teammates nodded. You bastards a dark-skinned boy with blonde hair said. He had a Kumo headband. Don't you dare do anything to Samui. Let her go. Really? Make me then. Said a certain blonde from the Iowa team. Dadara was his name. And the ten-year-old sticking his tongue out childishly, yet he was the one who was holding one of the Kumo Shinobis hostage. Opposite to the two Kumo Shinobis, three Iwa Nins, standing tall. And Dadara had a certain Kumo Kinoichi in his hand, hands wrapped around the back of her neck. While the poor girl was barely conscious, bleeding from her head. Her short blonde hair mixed with blood. In fact, all of the Shinobis from Kumo looked quite roughed up. As if they were running through an explosion. Well, they were, they fell into a trap, and Samui being older, pushed Derui off and got caught instead. The dark-skinned Kumo Nin, Derui would have moved to save his teammate, but his other teammate held his arm. Derui stop, they have us and they are too strong. So what do you want me to do, Yujito? He said, gripping his sword tightly while glaring daggers at one of the Iwa Shinobi. Particularly Dadara who was holding his teammate Samui hostage. Eri listen we shouldn't fight this one, Yujito said, sighing, taking out the scroll she was hiding. You want this, don't you just leave our teammate. We don't want this fight. Hey is that a heaven scroll? Dadara asked. Sorry, to say, we don't need that one. That's bad then, it means you are useless. Boss, should I kill her here just now, just wait, a minute. One of the Iwa Genin said. He had brown hair, and was quite famous in the land of Iowa. Also unlike Dadara, he looked a bit older, maybe he was 11 or 12. And was much more mature as well. I want to test out my skills first, but then again, we should just kill her to see if the cat awakens. And it made Yujito flinch, and Derry stop in his tracks. How do you know about that bastard? Derry growled. Iwa has its ways. Now let me propose a deal you there the brown-haired shinobi said. Pointing at Derry. Kill the Jinchuriki. And we won't kill her. A blonde for a blonde, an equal exchange, don't you think? A small grin appeared on his face when he saw the Kumo Shinobis freeze up. Yujito was hurt broken and a bit shaken up. As a Jinchuriki she wasn't given the best of treatments, and now go fuck yourself, bastard. Kumo Shinobis don't throw away their teammates, as you rock humpers do. Derry said. Fight me one on one if you have any backbone as the son of Thusachikage. That was right, the brown hair shinobi was none other than the son of Suchikage. Ku was his name. Eri saw a chance and with that he launched a Kumo team, waving a few hand signs. Storm release. Laser circus. 
and that a number of electric lasers came out of his hand and twisted around Samui's body before hitting Dadara. Yujido didn't miss the beat and moved quickly, taking Samui away. But she couldn't go far as the third one from the Iwa team stopped her. A tall boy with a giant broadsword in hand slashed to the side. The blade would hit Samui, so Yujito moved in a way where the sword hit her kunai, throwing her away. And the sword user took hold of Samui again. Yujito would run again this time with all of her strength. But then a crunching noise hit her ears, with a sound of a scream, aha you bastards. It was Derry, who was now on the ground with Ku above him, twisting his hand at an odd angle. Clearly broken. And Derry was in a lot of pain. Ants should know their place, trash. With that Ku stomped on Derry's face, almost knocking him out. He then looked at Dadara, kill her now, I want to see if the cat awakens or not. Or do I have to break every bone in the boy's body to get her to come? Dadara grinned as his third teammate threw the girl up in the air. The boy quickly took out some white clay-like objects, throwing them toward her. Yujito felt her world twist, and she felt the time slow down. As she saw her teammate, Samui's body up in the air, and those clay-like balls getting near her. She knew what those were. Adara was one of those explosion release users, and she knew the moment those things got near her, she would be in the explosion. It was how they fell into the trap at the first place. She loved both her teammates. Unlike others, they didn't discriminate because of her being a Jinchiriki. But now she felt helpless that they were going to die. And a deep rage was starting to awaken within her. But before anything else could happen. Suddenly with a blur, a green figure moved out of the trees, catching Samui's figure mid-air. The figure seemed as if he was jumping in the air, and quickly moved in the air in a way that was impossible, and avoided the explosions. But he wasn't alone ara ara why don't you children behave, now that the grown-ups are here. Said a certain nine-year-old Ichiha, holding a kunai to Ku's neck from behind. Ara ara and that was piss some of them off. What the who the fuck are you? Dadara said, seeing a beto. But before he could move he also felt a cold blade on the side of the neck. I wouldn't do that if I were you. A voice said from behind it was Rin. The third shinobi from Iwa also fell, after a few black niddle pierced his neck. Of course, it was Abido's handiwork. Armament Senbans. He was dead of course. Guy on the other hand was carrying the blonde Kumo Kanoichi like a princess. But at the same time, the future green beast of Kanoha was mad. But that was something that only his teammates noticed. Ku didn't seem worried, or at least he didn't let his emotions show on his face. Admirable for his age. What does Kanoha dogs want in this picking of when we are weak? I thought you Kanoha Shinobis had honor. Ku said. Honor, what's that? We are Shinobis for God's sake, not samurais. Abido chuckled, thinking about one of his friends. Anyway, well you might not like us Kanoha Shinobis meddling into your villain act of bullying your enemies. We do Abido then pointed at Yujito, who was carrying Samui. You see that girl right there is a Jinchiriki. And I don't care what your peanut brain thinks about it. But if she loses control and goes full beast, the Chunin exams could be cancelled. And I don't want that. I was given the mission to show off in the exams, and I will do just that. Any object that's in between me and my goals will be removed. Who chuckled, you really think you can beat me you are not even older than ya, I don't wanna hear your monologue. But I know I can beat you, that's why I'm going to leave you guys alive, you need to fight me in the third round for me to show off much. You know it's about me stepping on a big fish, like you, debuting my awesomeness to daimyos. Heck they might even want me for one of their personal bodyguards. Not that I want that position. You are really a cocky one aren't you with that Ku and Dadara made their move. Dadara ducked forward from his place, while a white snake-like paper wrapped around Rin's legs. Dadara also threw a few white paper balls at her while she was distracted, made one hand sign, and with that, it exploded. But when the smoke cleared there was only water. As if it didn't explode blood and flesh, but water. And Dadara felt an odd sense of deja vu when he felt cold steel on his neck. As I said, don't move and I will kill you this time. It was Rin, who looked cold and murderous from Dadara's back. And the blonde shinobi surrounded. He gulped and looked at Ku's fight instead. But he was just as surprised. On the other hand same time, Ku made his move, quickly doing a back kick. Kicking Abido away, he quickly used his flying ability and got into the air. He quickly took out several shurikens and threw them at Abido. Almost all of them pierced the Achiha. 
Huh, not so tough now. He snorted. When suddenly the Kanoha Shinobi came he was caught off guard, but it seemed that was just a fluke. You really think that would have worked against me? You are underestimating my awesomeness here. Abito said, standing in the air just behind him. With his kunai on the back of Ku's head, like previously. For the first time in a while, Ku felt fear boiling inside him. Telling him to run. He made his move again, but he accidentally came to an eye-to-eye -eye contact with the Ichiha. And froze. As I said, I will let you live. I wanted to kill your other teammate as well. But I don't think you would have any guts to attend the third round then. Abito mused, before showing eyes that was cold enough to make any experienced shiver. I will make you quack in fear, like how Madara did with your father. Hey, maybe you might start calling me dad after this. Now go sleep. With that suddenly the Iwa Shinobi's vision blurred, and he was knocked out. Dropping from the air to the ground. Adara who also saw that wanted to do something before he felt a sharp pain in behind his head. And he was out cold. Well, our work is done here Abito mused as he became a flock of bats disappearing and reappearing right beside Guy. How long are you going to carry her anyway? Guy blinked and looked down at the blonde girl that was looking back at her. The blush rising on the Kanoha Shinobi's face. But he didn't back down, he would do every work through and through. She seems comfortable here. I think we should hold on to her until she's fully okay. Abito blinked. Dude, are you for real? She's also a potential enemy. Give her back to her teammate so that we can go. And she doesn't look well either. Yes, can you please give her back? Ujido Nai said. She was still a bit tense and was helping her other teammate Derry with his injury. Giving the boy a painkiller to wear off the pain for now. They were afraid of Abido. Because, unlike Ku, they recognized him. He was reported to be one of the best prodigies that Kano had produced. And now they knew why. Even Ku, who was rumored to know the dust release, was taken out in seconds. So of course they had their guards up. Guy walked towards them a bit, before putting her down. Looking at her, most of her back was burned, and there was a nasty wound to the side of her head. Her hair getting burned off a bit, blonde strands mixed with blood. The Kumo team was still hesitant but quickly got near her. Tending to her. She was in critical condition and needed quick medical attention. Even though she was still conscious, it was fading in and out. Anyone with basic knowledge would know that. You know she will die like this Abito said not sugarcoating things. As he looted the Ku's body for the scroll. A heaven scroll. Just the thing that they needed. He quickly pocketed any other scrolls the boy had also. Of course, they were locked, but for a semester like him, it would be easy. Then you have to do something, Abito, Guy said almost whispering as he got back to his side. Abito sighed, the world doesn't work like the guy. I will help her if they give me something in exchange. My friend here is a good doctor. Guy said, so is my other teammate. And I can vouch for their skills. So if you need help, please tell. The boy said sincerely. Derry and Yujito Nai looked at their teammate and back to Abito. They were also a bit afraid of Guy, his speed at that I'm sure Sensei can give her medical attention. Derry said. Well Yujito bit her lips. Abito shrugged. Then you would be a fool. Even if the fast speed you would need at least half an hour to get out of the forest. And by then she might get permanent brain damage. You would be late then. He said, also we won't stop you if you want to run. It's up to you if you prioritize your teammate or not. This made the Kumo team even more surprised because of Abito's nature. He was rather kind for an Ichiha. The village always said that they were blood-sucking demons with red eyes. Wait. Was that about the Ichiha or some other clan? Abito didn't stand and started walking the opposite way. As if he didn't care about the deal at all. But he was in fact hiding a small grin. Rin, guy let's go I help them for free already. I can't just do charity work in a world filled with blood and gore. Yujito Nai was the one to speak. What do you want? Abito stopped in his tracks and spun. Well, not anything special. You see, unlike Kanoha, Yukumo Shinobis have access to a lot of life, so I was wondering if you would be kind enough to share. Never. That would be treachery. Yujito rejected the request immediately. Abito shook his head. No one needs to find out that you gave something to a foreign shinobi. And I would keep my mouth shut. It's not like I can use lightning release anyway, I just want something for a friend of mine. But that would be hiding secrets from your own village, Derry spoke this time. 
well, that or your teammate. I can of course get lightning releases with these eyes of mine. But I wanted it firsthand if you valued your teammates enough you would have given it without hesitation. Patriotism and whatnot don't go well with me. I can only give a fuck about so many people before it becomes a burden. But it's up to you. Abito hummed before adding. I hate Iowa, cause of a certain incident. But that doesn't mean I have love for Kumo. You see one of my close ones is like you, Ajin Chiriki. I respect her quite a lot. And when she was just a kid, your village tried to kidnap her. But in a weird way, I saw her in you. Remember that, my kindness and my awesomeness. Abito chuckled at the last part. Yujito Nai was wide-eyed. And almost didn't believe that her village would do such a thing. But then again, she was a frog in well. And the shinobi world was much cruel. Even though the Ichi had joked about the situation, both the Kumo shinobis respected Abido for what he did. And for how strong he was. Wait I why? Derry stopped her, shaking his head. Let me. It's because of me that Samui Sanin injured. And you are ostracized by the village already. And I don't want you to fall into another problem if the information does leak out. It won't. My lips are sealed tight as Madara's coffin. Abido added. Derry looked at Abido. Ichiha. We might not be enemies today, but we might be in the future. So don't think I will show mercy when I meet you next time. PFT, that's cute. Abido laughed. As if I would let myself fall behind a hard head like you. That won't happen. Now, are you going to give any jutsus? Derry nodded. Abido grinned internally as he moved inside the forest. That was quite the loot. Of course, mainly the jutsu Derry gave them. It wasn't storm release. Laser Circus. It was one of the unique wide-range lightning jutsu. An air rank jutsu. Abido understood why Derry gave the particular jutsu. It was hard to learn, and Abido was just given a scroll. The thing is Derry was actually carrying the jutsu on him, in that scroll. And even he didn't properly master it properly. So he was betting on the difficulty of the jutsu. But it was enough for him. Derry felt quite glad that Abido didn't outright ask for his storm release jutsu. But there was a reason for that. Abido simply didn't need it. He had already copied it with his eyes. Using it would require time, more so, because he wasn't particularly good with lightning release or water release. But he could of course pass on the knowledge to others. So helping the Kumo really was a good decision. Getting two lightning related jutsus. Derry's whole team would forfeit the exam now. Also, this way Kumo would learn to not let their Jinchuriki off. Of course when news of this falls into the ears of people like Danzo, he will be questioned. But if he played his cards right, he could be seen as the naive one that saw her sensei and a poor girl put in a similar situation. Abido thought this through, killing the host of two tails wouldn't do him any good. The beast wasn't really that strong compared to the other tailed beasts. Also, it will pop up again in the future if that happens. And then of course by treaty Kumo will want the tailed beast. And with how Kanoha is publicized as a peaceful nation. Having another nuke in the form of a house cat won't do them any good. Information couldn't be kept hidden all the time. Heck, Danzo might even release it to the world just to put the Ichiha clan at risk. Or even to start his monarchy. Killing her here, in the long run, wouldn't do any benefit. And why would he kill her off in the first place? Because of Kanoha, yeah he wasn't going to buy that. And what could she do exactly? Making a perfect Jinchuriki move on the front lines was foolish, and would be much more beneficial to keep her in the village, if the war bleeds in there. Also even if the cannon was broken off, Derry might be the future cage. He might be weak now, but that could change in the future. So he would rather have a healthy relationship with him, rather than anything else. He was both a potential enemy and an ally. He hated acting passively this way. But sometimes that was how things went. What could he do, there were people like Guy and Rin there. And he didn't want to show his cold side to him just yet. Better have a good bond with future allies, rather than eliminate people that might never be your enemy. Now that Abido had both a heaven scroll and an earth scroll. They didn't need to wait anymore. Even with all the shenanigans, only two hours had passed, but that would be enough for a new record. If I'm not wrong Itachi finished the exam in five hours. Let's aim for three then. Abido mused before looking at his teammates. Rin was still on the lead, and Guy was on his side with him. Guys let's not stop till we reach the tower. So full speed ahead. Abito said, before pausing. 
Rin think you can keep the lead. She didn't say anything just speed up. Abito smirked at that. Is she still trying to prove herself? Abito thought before shrugging. Now that she improved her skills, it's bound to get like this. Even when he started training under Kagami. The first few months he just trained so that Kagami acknowledges him. Then after that Kagami gave a long talk on not doing that and only train hard for himself. But in the process of proving himself, his abilities improved. That's why he wasn't stopping Rin. He just had to make sure that she doesn't burn herself in the process. Because, unlike Rin, Abido, Guy, and Kakashi were trained for way longer. So she still had lots of catching up to do. But at the same time, she was improving at a very fast pace. As all of them speed up. Abido took the time to think. If he finished the exam, he would need to wait at the tower for five whole days, and it was prohibited to leave. So going there would be boring, he would much rather spend his time seeing the genins fight it out in the forest. But first things first. He needed to get some new earth and wind release jutsus. Not that he was expecting any mere genin to have good jutsus on hand. But he had the time, so why not look into it. And troll some genins while at it. With that he switched himself with his Nightwing clone, and merged with the ground. Soon the Ichiha came out of the ground and saw his team leave without them even knowing. Now where should I go in a forest clearing, one could see three sand shinobis were facing off against three mist shinobi. A bloody battle was taking place between kids that even reached puberty. That was the reality of this cruel world. The sand village and the mist village didn't like each other that much. An old rivalry to gain control of fertile land. After the village system was created, Mist wanted to rule the land of water because they lived there. And Sand wanted the Mist lands for their fertile lands. But with time the battle started coming to an end. Out of the three Sand Shinobis, only one remained standing. A girl that had odd green hair with orange highlights. Her teammates dead, lying lifelessly on the ground. The Kura was the only one to survive the Mist team's attack. She had suggested her teammates to run and not engage. But the mist shinobis were too fast, encasing them in their hidden mist jutsu. Now that she was using her elemental release the hidden mist jutsu dropped. And she could see her teammates. In the mist team, there were two rookies that were quite famous. Zabuza and Kissam. Both kids had quite the reputation in the mist and were quite powerful. Both being too cruel even back in their own village. Kakura survived due to her using her bloodline ability. Scorch release. But now she pitted against three and one. And she saw no way that she could come out of this alive. Yet there was no fear visible in her face. No, there was only anger. Pure rage boiled inside her, seeing her teammates dead. As a sand orphan, she had rarely any people she could trust her back to. But her team was a different case. They accepted her as not only as a friend but as family. But now they were dead, because of those missed bastards. Should we loot their bodies for their scrolls? Kissam asked, with a sharp grin expression. Parrying a huge sword, but the boy was just as tall, not looking his age. No need, Zabuza said. The boy was in bandages that covered his face. They don't have the scroll that we need I already kept an eye open for the teams that had our scrolls. Kissam laughed. Yeah, I knew that. But I just wanted to make the girl a bit angry. Pakura couldn't stand it. They attacked their team, even though they didn't have the heaven scroll the mist needed. They killed his teammates just for the fun of it. And she wouldn't stand that. I'm going to kill you all. Pakura shouted, going through hand signs. Scorch style. Extreme steaming murder. With that flaming orbs of hot fire and wind came out of her body, multiple of them. And they shot forward towards her opponents. She didn't stand still either taking out her two kunais she also charged forward. Controlling three scorch balls at the same time with fighting was too much for her. But she had to do it, if she wanted to survive. Oh, fuck don't let those balls of fire hit you, Zabuza called out, keeping a distance. Kissam and the other one trying to do the same. She clashed with all of her might against the three mist shinobis, that were avoiding the scorch balls like a plague. But as she charged she caught one of the mist shinobis with her scorch release. Drying the moisture out of the body killed him immediately. But at that moment she let her guard down, and Zabuza and Kissam took the chance to attack her. Oh, shit she got Han. Zabuza called out. But he didn't have the time to say anything as the sand Kanoichi attacked him immediately. The anger didn't make Pakura's judgment unclear, no, it only made her senses sharper. A talent that only few had. 
And due to the anger, her scorch release got even stronger. As she fought Zabuza. Hitting him with slashes with her kunai, the mist shinobi was having a hard time avoiding her attack and the scorching ball of fire. The heat was so much that even being near it, drained the water in the surrounding. Kissam couldn't help Zabuza either, as two of the scorch release balls. But both Kissam and Zabuza were skilled for their age as well. Seeing no other way, Zabuza engaged in a frantic exchange of blows with Pakura. And Kissam took the time to attack. Water style. Shark bullet jutsu. The droplets of water spewed from Kissam's mouth attacked both Pakura and Zabuza. But at the last moment, Zabuza dashed out of the way. Making Pakura take the attack head on. Ah the girl screamed when the shark-like bullets hit her. And she couldn't defend with her scorched balls. I'm not done with you bitch. Pakura was wide-eyed when she heard the voice of Zabuza behind her. And quickly turned around to parry the attack. But it was too late. She couldn't even scream as she fell forward, grabbing her stomach, blood, and intestines coming out of her. And Zabuza kicked making her fall to the ground helpless and injured. DCH this bitch killed Han. Now we are one teammate less. That boy was weak in the first place. That's why he died. He's not irreplaceable. Kissam said, kicking the girl on the back. She moved a bit forward, still curling up due to wound, as she tried to stop the bleeding. But it wouldn't do anything. So she could only glare hatefully at the missed Shinobis. She just wanted them to die. I for taking everything she had valued. But she wasn't strong enough. I. Will. Kill. You. She said those words with much difficulty. Oh, she still has the energy left to curse. Are all sand bitches like that back in your country, Kissam chuckled. Should we just end her misery? Kissam shook his head. No, she killed one of us. Let her suffer. The wild animals could just eat her up if we just leave the area. The blood has already attacked a lot of praying birds. The two missed Shinobis looked up, and sure enough, vultures were already eyeing the dead bodies. Park heard everything and even saw the missed Shinobis going away. But her anger didn't fade. She still wanted to kill those bastards. If only she wasn't this weak. If there was only a way to become strong. But sure enough, her vision was starting to black out. She had lost too much blood, didn't she? Oh, you don't look too good, child. A voice said, Pakura didn't even have the strength to move her head and see who it was. Her vision was already hazy. Do you want to live? That was a stupid question. Of course, she wanted to live. For some reason, she didn't find any mockery in that voice. But her stomach was split open. She wouldn't make it alive she knew it. But she still wanted to live. Pakura gritted her teeth, yes, she panted. I want. To. Live. She squeaked out. But she wasn't finished. And. I want. Them. Dead. Hate still brewing in her voice. So much willpower and hate. The unknown voice said. Let's see what I can do, child but remember that you will be indebted to me. She couldn't say anything anymore. Her vision had completely blacked out. And the pain was only getting stronger. And she just wanted to sleep. With that she passed out. While other things were happening, Abito was enjoying first row seats in an interesting fight. He had nothing else to do, he already sent one of his bats to inform Kagami that there was a Kumo Jinchiriki on Kanoha grounds. They could do whatever with the information. A team from the Land of Tea was fighting against a team full of Ritids from Yuzushi Agakur. The fight was interesting only because one of the Ritids was fighting, while the other two stood still. The Yuzumaki team compromised on a boy with a cross-shaped birthmark on his cheek. And two girls, both looked similar, twins maybe. The Yuzumaki boy attacked fearlessly, each sword striking near perfectly aiming for the vitals. And the T-team could barely keep up with the energetic Riti that attacked them. Actually, it was the Land of T that attacked them, but the Genins from the Land of Whirlpools were just that strong. The team from the Yuzumaki village had sent some strong kids it seems. Abito mused as the fight ended. He wasn't hiding or anything just sitting on a tree branch enjoying his chips. And so the moment the three Uzumakis noticed him, they threw shurikens at him. But like everything it passed through his body as if he was an illusion. Well, he was. Now that wasn't cool, Abito said, standing lazily just behind the two twins. Making them jump like feral cats when they noticed him. The Achiha of course ignored the senbans, shurikens, and kunais thrown his way dogging them smoothly. But gotta say you guys are very good. 
Guys stop now that I see it. You are a Bito Ichiha. Right. The Yuzumaki boy said. Oh, so you do know me, Abito said, disappearing from his spot, appearing a few distances behind the Yuzumaki boy, kneeling down, hocking a stick onto the unconscious Tishinobi. Your skills really are amazing as they say. The boy said, looking at Abito. You are not only making your location, but somehow you are faking it. I expect nothing less from someone who's trained by Kashina-san. Abito hummed, before smiling. It's not that fun when people figure out my trick. I tend to stay mysterious. Okay. Kenshi said, tilting his head to the side. That's when Abito knew that the boy was not the fun type. A boring Yuzumaki, that kind of people existed. Then again not everyone could be Naruto Yuzumaki. You guys have really good sensing ability with your minds Ikagura. But after training under her for years, I picked up a few tricks. Though, she can still catch me just fine. The Yuzumaki boy nodded. It's amazing that I finally met you. Before we fight I would like to give out my name. I'm Kenshi Yuzumaki, the next leader of the Yuzumaki village. He said as he pointed his sword at Abido. His sword was a katana similar to the one Kakashi used, but was black. The Achiha rolled his eyes. Yeah, I don't want to be the bringer of bad news. But I won't be fighting you right now. I hope you understand. Okay, the boy nodded, sheathing his sword. The boy really was the boring and serious type. But he was strong and that was good. Then why did you come here? You know just to see how my competition is doing also you guys need an earth scroll right? Yes Kenshi said with a raised eyebrow. You don't happen to have one do you? Abito smiled. I do actually. He said, tossing the scroll to the Yuzumaki. Take it you guys have some skills. And why not show it off in the third round rather than doing it here? Kenshi looked at the scroll and frowned. But accepted it. Kenshi was interested in Abito for several reasons. In relation, Kishina was her cousin, and she once brought an Achiha to the Yuzumaki village. A thing that hadn't been done ever. So he was interested in him, but due to reasons, he couldn't meet him at that time. But now he understood why her cousin took him in as a disciple. Abito didn't show much, but he was clearly good at stealth and hiding. A skill that was even more impressive when you add in three Uzumakis couldn't find his exact location. Anyway, hope we clash in the third round. Also if you want, I can give you a tour of Konoha after this round's over. Though it will take five days to finish. Abito said, lazily moving around. Then we can spar then. And she asked. Sure, but don't be butt hurt when I beat you. With that Abito's body twisted in an odd way near the head, as if he was getting twisted out of reality. And he was gone. Kenshi smirked. Abito's signature disappeared as well. He really is impressive. I can't wait to try out my sword against him. He said, grabbing his blade tightly. Abito was going fast towards the location where the bat cave was. He didn't have anything else to do. So he would get to the tower after doing some research work in the bat cave. His clone was technically him. So he wasn't worried about getting disqualified. Abito also wanted to fight him one-on-one. -on -one. After seeing Kenshi use his sword, Abito was wanted to fight him one-on-one -on -one without too much additional help from ninjutsu. Abito didn't use swords, he found his gloves and armament spike more interesting, but the way Kenshi used his sword was quite similar to how he used his armament rods. Sword techniques and fighting moves could be easily copied with a Sharingan when someone was as skilled as Abito. But he wanted to take a step further and modify sword techniques where he could use it with his armament rods. He wanted to know how far he could push his eyes. Abito had a theory. It most probably is wrong, but he wanted to know if he could train himself to awaken the Manjekyo Sharingan. He had a theory that the Manjekyo Sharingan is awakened as a mechanism of protection. Losing close relatives or even trauma was usually the key to awakening the normal Sharingan. And yet only a few were able to awaken it to the next stage. A shinobi's life is filled with grief. If just losing loved ones was the answer to awaken the Manjekyo, then almost half of the clan would have them by now. No there has to be something different. And he wanted to know it. Abito would have gone to find out the Sand team and the Mist team, but from the bats, he found out that both teams engaged each other, and one team got eliminated. So he didn't have any other teams that he was interested in right now. The sun was already down, so no more battles should happen. The forest animals like it peaceful at night, and there shouldn't be anyone who would fight each other right now. 
But right then, Abito heard a small boom from a far area. Did I speak too soon? But let's see who would be stupid enough to attack each other at night. Abito could go to his cave anytime he wanted. But he wanted to see who was causing a commotion. Usually, it was an unwritten rule to not fight at night. As Abito got near his eyes quickly widened. Fuck. Anko Mitarashi looked a bit worried as she stood her ground against a three Kiri Shinobi. Guys I think we shouldn't fight it's already getting dark here. She told her teammates. Come on Anko, don't be a scardy cat, and it's not like we are alone, said one of her teammates, as he looked at the other Kanoha team that were along them. The boy like Anko also came from a civilian background. And was quite talented to be a part of Team Arachimaru. Jin what do you say the Hyuga and his team had already activated his Dejutsu, looking at the enemy. They have quite the powerful chakra, but I'm sure I can take them head on. Anko bit her lips and stayed shut. She had a bad feeling about this, even with the numbers advantage. In her team, she knew Jin was the strongest, and could give most genins run for their money, and with the training, her sensei put them through, he came out much stronger. And we have the numbers advantage anyway they are only two, Asuma said as he took out his special bracers with wind chakra flowing through them. And they are only two anyways. Kurinai and the other boy on her team nodded. Actually, it was Asuma who created the explosion with his ash-burning jutsu. Six against two that seems unfair. Zipuzum used. But we are stupid for our to fall into your trap. Asuma snorted. We are Shinobis the last thing we should worry about is being fair. And I know about both of you. You guys are the strongest genins in the mist. Taking care of you here would be quite an honor. Even though all of the kids didn't even reach the age of puberty, they were quite comfortable in killing each other. That was how the times were when you were born in a war-torn era. T-C-H-Y, Zabuza can I kill all of them? They are pretty weak. Kissum said with a sadistic grin. After their fight with Pakura they had recovered, and now they were back to full health. It's already getting dark, but then again they were the ones who attacked first. So finish it quickly. Zabuza said with a boring expression. No, I don't think so a voice called from above making all five of the genins look at the tree. But they could only see two red dots in the darkness, glaring at them. Oh, another fish to fry. Just how many leaf humpers are there Kissam grinned, this time he was thrilled when he sensed the Achiha. The other six leaf shinobis were weak, but Abito looked strong to him. He looks strong he said, tightly holding his sword. Zabuza nodded, drawing his broadsword as well. Abito ignored the mist shinobis and looked at the Kanoha team. You over there you are Anko, right? You seem to be friends with Rin. Get your team out of here you guys are no match. You too Asuma. You will get your teammates killed even if you gang up on these two. You guys are not at their level yet. Anko blinked when she heard Abito. She knew the Achiha, hardly anyone did not know about him. He was rumored to be as strong as Kakashi. An Ichiha prodigy whose talent was as equal to Madara. Of course, it wasn't like she was a fangirl or anything. Like I will listen to an Ichiha, Jin said, his glare intensifying as he looked at Abito. Yeah, don't get ahead of yourself, Abito. Asuma protested when she saw Kurinai smile looking at Abito. He didn't like the fact that his crush was also an Ichiha fangirl. I have gotten stronger now. I can probably beat with a stick. Asuma did interact with Abito quite a lot. Due to him always challenging him to show off against Kurinai. And failed miserably all the time. Even though he wouldn't call Asuma his friend, but he did know the boy. So it would be bad letting him get killed. I wasn't asking, midgets, Abito said releasing his chakra, his crimson eyes spinning rapidly. The pressure dawing all of them still. That was an order. But Anko knew it wasn't normal chakra, no, it was chakra released with killing intent. She asked her sensei once how he pulled that trick with chakra. And he said one has to kill strong opponents to be able to draw out that intent. And she gulped. They weren't exaggerating when they said Abito was a prodigy. She could hardly move, it was as if Arachimaru sensei was glaring at them. Now go Abito said, his voice sounding heavy. And all three of the Kanoha shinobi moved out without protest. Even Jin and Asuma didn't say anything. Kissam and Zabuza had sweat on their foreheads, but rather than being worried they looked excited. There was a brief of silence and still, before the two missed Shinobis moved. One cast a water bullet jutsu, while the other jumped towards the tree to attack. And yet the Achiha blocked the bullets with a black rotted staff, before blocking the sword with it. They clashed, Zabuza and Kissam. 
Both tried their best to kill the Acheha, who casually dodged their attacks. Minutes passed yet the Mist Shinobis couldn't overpower the Acheha. This is getting boring, Abito said, thrusting his palm forward, breaking Zabuza's sword with his armament hand, grabbing him by the face, and making eye contact. Jinjutsu. Sharingan. And the boy fell like puppet without strings. Kisum wanted to attack Abito, but flicked his other arm, and threw armament senbens at him. The shark boy couldn't deflect all of them, and some hit his skin, but he was ready to attack when suddenly Zabaza's body was thrown at him. Now, that they are far enough Abito mumbled looking at the two missed Shinobis. If I ever find that you attacked one us Kanoha Shinobis I will personally come and kill you. For now, you have your miserable lives. And if you do want to fight me then you can meet me in the third round of the exam. With that Abito's body twisted in space, before disappearing. Kissam gritted his teeth in frustration, and yet he was excited about the prospect of fighting the Acheha again. But for now, he had to take care of Zabuza. Abito sighed in relief after he got the Kanoha Shinobis out of the problem. He was always the kind kid, helping others. Kagami always said it was his reason to unlock the Sharingan, then help Sakumo. And in the years he got his emotions and morals mixed up due to the Anbu training. Leading a life of killers mixes your morals. Sure he didn't kill anyone back then, but the training drove away some of the hesitations normal genins faced. Kagami did warn him to not take the Anbu training that early on. But due to the rush of power he did. And he didn't regret that. It opened his eyes to many things. After coming to the shinobi world he came to know about the reality of the world. You can't be kind to everyone. It might seem hypocritical, but he would prioritize some people's life over others. Why? Because these were the people he knew. Sure all of them were human, but we tend to only care about those who we know about. Abido wasn't any different, and he didn't deny the fact and accepted it. Our limitations to help others make us human. He thought, even though he knew gaining said strength might remove those limitations. Abido was originally from the modern world. Where all humans should be treated equally, that's what he was taught in school and other places. But after coming to the world of blood and swords, he accepted that it was a fool's dream. Even in the modern world, some countries would only help each other for their own benefit. And large letter organizations would be puppet masters in legally authorizing the acts. It was hypocritical actually. At least now his loyalty lies with Kanoha. Well, not all of it, but for the people he knew he would try to at least save them, if it didn't bother him that much. And for the people he cared about, putting his life on the line wasn't an option, it was a must. He really would have liked to have to play things out. But when he saw Asuma, and others were in danger, his body just moved on its own. They were people he knew, so of course, he would help them out if he could. Am I a good person? Nah, but I'm not bad either. Abid amused. Then what am I? Impulsive. Impulsive to help others, when it's none of my damn business. He laughed as he made his way toward his lab. His morals were getting really questionable, but he accepted it. He would embrace the change. Abido stopped his running and looked around, before using his Earth Ghost Jutsu to merge himself with the ground. There were a few entrances to the Bat Cave, but he mostly used this method to enter his cave. He had special seals placed where only he could enter the ground without getting into an explosion or setting of the alarms in his base. Now. Let's get some work done on my gloves Abito said, as he entered his lab. Except he wasn't alone. A certain bat and a koichi from the sand were sitting in the medical section of his lab. Boy, you took too long. Come let me introduce you to the newest summoner of the bat clan. Abito blinked once, twice. Before he said. What? On the other side of Kanoha, Kakashi was having a hard time reading his favorite adventure story. The Scarecrow Shinobi didn't start reading his famous smut books, because Jiraiya didn't even publish the first one. Anyway, he couldn't have some peaceful reading time, just because of one kid, which happened to be in a chair. The face mask wearing Shinobi closed his book and looked over at the kid. Didn't I tell you that I don't have the time to train with you go ask someone from your clan? Yes, I know, but Big Bro said you would be better for training. With your weird fi- I don't train with kids go bother someone else. He said, trying to show him away. Shisui shook his head with a serious expression. I can't do that big bro told me a secret. The most effective way for an Acheha to get stronger is to fight a Senju. And you are the only Senju I know of, and also because you know of lightning release. 
Of course, Abito would say those weird stuff. And as an Ichiha don't you have any pride that you are asking a senju? Kakashi asked bluntly. Nope. I'm shameless when it comes to training. Shisui replied with a puff chest. Now he understood why his father always told him that Kagami was unlike other Ichihas, he passed down that ability to his nephew as well. But I'm sorry, I won't train with you, Kakashi said bluntly, with a sweat drop expression. It wasn't his first shameless Ichiha, not even the last. He lazily was getting back to his book. Go bother someone else, kid. I refuse to train you. Well, then I refuse your refusal, Shisui said grinning. Abito taught you that as well, didn't he? Yup. Kakashi sighed, why couldn't things be easy? But then again, he was trying to figure out a way to use Minato's Rasengan with the lightning release. Getting an up on Abito. And having Ichiha help might ease the process. Lately, he couldn't train with his father because of all the missions. Five days passed and the Chunin exam second stage of the second round began. The preliminaries. Of course, the fights were simple. Nothing noteworthy just to weed out the weak ones that didn't deserve to go to the third round. Abito was with his team observing the fights. Even Minato was with them. They weren't any audience or anything just the participants that passed watching the fights and their senseis. This is boring Abito whined, I could be researching on my gloves rather than watching this stupid stuff. It's almost like I'm watching kids fights. Rin sweat dropped at Abito. You do know we are all kids. But Abito of course ignored her comments. Like I said, they are practically babies. Just ignore him, Minato said, rolling his eyes. He almost got used to Abito's shenanigans. But he didn't know if that was good or bad. The fight was between Dadara and one Kumo Shinobi. Ujido's team wasn't the only one that came from Kumo, but they were of course the strongest, but they forfeited the match when Ujido's identity as a Jinchuriki was reviled. The fight soon ended with Dadara using his clay to blow the Kumo Shinobi up. Taking his arm out in the process. The match was a bloody one, but Dadara missed his chance to kill the Kumo boy when he forfeited. Abito looked to his side and saw in a bit shaken up. She wasn't that used to seeing people get killed. Maybe he should have left a few tea shinobis to her to get her first blood experience back on the hot spring mission. But now was too late. Oi, don't sweat it. Abito said, you don't need to always kill your opponent. But you have to make sure they don't attack you when you think they are out. Faking it and attacking is a cheap trick that works even on seasoned shinobis. That's why I prefer killing them. Rin looked at him. That didn't help. Guy nodded, that wasn't nice either. Though I do get what you mean. Sometimes knocking them out without killing them is quite hard. It limits you. Abito nodded. Well, just kill them, that's what I'm saying. Remember while we might let them live, they won't be so merciful to us. Even with all the political shenanigans in Kanoha, we never started an official war. And we are at the doorsteps of another war. So forget about going easy on them. It's sad, but it's reality. Isn't that right old man? Rin and Guy blinked and looked behind them. It was Kagami. Minato nodded at the older shinobi. Huh, brat so you didn't lose your skills. Kagami mused as he stepped forward and leaned on the railing. But then again I was the one to train you. Abito rolled his eyes, Shimelisi bragging about yourself. You haven't changed either old man. Kagami pouted, why do you have to call me an old man? I'm not even married. Your romantic life has nothing to do with your old age, more to do with your lack of game in that field, Abito said casually. Damn guy and Minato winched at the burnt comment. Why you come here Kagami grabbed Abito and wrestled on the ground, with Kagami having the upper hand. Everyone sweat dropped at the scene. Rin just shook her head, what else did he expect from some that trained Abito? His ability to poke fun at everything was contagious. Contestant the announcer blinked looking at the clipboard, just to make sure he was seeing the numbers right. Before coughing again, contestants number 69 and number 35 please come to the field. Rin blinked. How did Abito get that number when only 40 people came out of the forest without getting disqualified or killed? And what did that number mean anyway? It was you, wasn't it old man? You changed it, didn't you Abito who now freed himself from Kagami said pointing at him. Kagami scratched the back of his head and whistled as if he didn't know anything. I don't know what you are talking about. I will get back at you for that Abito just clicked his tongue, before jumping down to the stage. From the other side, another Kanoha genin come down the field. Both contestants were on the field. 
and Abito could hear a few fangirls cheer for him. How the heck did he gain fangirls when he didn't even attend the academy regularly? Huh, the consequence of being too awesome. Let the battle start. Abito and his opponent didn't move and waited. He wanted to see the opponent's first move, which happened to be a monologue. Today I will let you know why the Byakugan is the strongest Dejutsu. It was none other than Jin Hayuga. Anko's teammate. One of the prodigies from the Hayuga clan. And he was also a member of the main branch. It means his ego was also inflated. Abito couldn't hold it and laugh. God oh god please don't. He said, trying to control his laughter. That was the most cringest and funny shit I ever heard. I didn't know the Hayuga clan was taking up stand-up comedy these days. I give 7 points as certain Achiha said from the background, holding a scoreboard with the number 7. But Abito ignored that. Why you don't mock me Achiha? Hayuga said, activating his Dejutsu. Vines popping out of his eye socket. Making him look extremely interesting. Abito lazily looked at the Hayuga. Yeah, I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings. But yeah, let's have a good fight. The boy politely said, with a gentle smile. It even made Jinnies down a bit. So even the Achiha knew he couldn't mock the clan. But the gentle smile on Abito's face twisted into a disgusting grin. As he took the same stance as the Hayuga. I'm so sorry in fact, I will beat you with your own clan techniques, without using my own dejutsu or any other techniques. He said. Isn't he just precious, Kagami puffed his chest proudly and looked at Minato. I raised that boy. The yellow flash of Kanoha sweat dropped and said nothing. Yeah, that's why he turned out to be so humble. The Hayuga's eyes twitched with anger and fury, I will make you regret that. With that, the Hayuga moved. His speed was too fast for normal genins to see. He just appeared right in front of Abido with an open palm. But Abido countered the attack with his own. Open palm meeting, open palm. But the Hayuga didn't feel like he was hitting flesh, no, it felt like he was hitting steel. Well of course it was, Abito was still wearing his armament gloves. The Hayuga didn't back down though, sticking at multiple angles with his open palms. Yet all of his attacks would get stopped by Abito's attack midway. It was as if he knew where the Hayuga would strike. It went on for a full minute before Jin quickly backed down. Aw oh, did I tire you too much, Abito said, with a funny expression. And here I thought you would be the end of me. The Hayuga snorted. I didn't want to use the technique on someone from my own village. But you made me do this Abito rolled his eyes. Yeah, get to it quickly moon eyes. But this time Abito moved first, attacking the Hayuga with his own version of gentle fist. Abito actually had trained on this Dejutsu by Kagami. Of course, a Sharingan user couldn't take full advantage of the limitations of the fighting style. But he could with his glitch vision. And after training and honing it with his friend Yukai Kohinata. He created a fighting style that was his own version of the gentle fist. Though, unlike the Hayuga Abito couldn't fully shut off all the chakra networks with his technique. His chakra control was good, but he couldn't do it, he could shut off some, while others would remain open. So in a critical battle, he avoided using them. But that didn't mean, he couldn't use this exam to grind up his gentle fist skill. You're within my range now Jin said, powering up his chakra in his palms and finally got his chance. Two palms, four palms, eight palms, sixteen palms, thirty-two palms, eight trigram sixty-four palms. Abito's body was thrown away, but suddenly with a puff of smoke, his body was replaced with a log. What substitution jutsu? When, don't act that surprised. Jin heard Abito's voice from behind him. We did learn this back at the academy. But before the Hayuga could turn, Abito smacked him in the head so hard that he flew a couple of distance, before rolling on the ground. How how could you, Jin said, trying to stand up with much difficulty. How can you beat me without using your Dejutsu? A cause I'm strong? No, I don't accept it. You must have cheated in the exam. Jin said, now that he could barely stand up with shaky legs. Abito frowned, with squinted eyes, before he sighed. You know there's some remarkably dumb people in this world. Thanks for helping me understand that. I won't accept this the Hayuga said, but Abito suddenly disappeared from his spot. How you can tap, go sleep. Another smack to the back of his head and that was the last this he heard. Go sleep. The announcer was stunned for a while, ah the winner is contestant number 69. No one cheered almost all of them were flabbergasted at how one-sided it was. 
Well, one did cheer, but he was the unusual Ichiha. D did he just smack the Hayuga to sleep? One of the contestants from the upper floor asked. He sure did. On the upper floors of the stadium Kissam grinned, he was very excited to fight someone like Abito. Not knowing it might be his end. Another genin from Iowa also looked quite pissed about Abito. Of course, it was Ku, the son of the Shuchikage. Abito quickly got to the upper floor after his fight. The next fight was between Ku and another shinobi from the tea village. The match ended quickly, but Abito did get the chance to see the Iowa shinobi use the flight technique again. And it wasn't only him, who was racking his brain on how the technique was used. How can Earth release decrease weight to that level? Kagami mumbled. I always thought the old dwarf used wind jutsu to get the flight, but it seems I was wrong. Earth release is used to make gravity seals, so it should be able to do the opposite. Abito said, even though, I and Guy can use something similar to flight using our tojutsu, it would be useful to learn it. You mean copy it. Kagami snickered. You know your eyes really does have a talent for copying stuff. So I would bet you will get the technique under your belt before the third round. Abito didn't say anything, but a small smile crept up on his face. We'll see. Soon the next fight started. And it was between Rin and Anko. Kagami leaned in on the railing. This should get interesting, the matchup between the disciples of the future Hokage candidates. Minato flinched who was standing on his side. But didn't say anything. But Guy was wide-eyed as he looked at Minato with respect. And the yellow flash felt a bit shy about the Beto commented, making the blonde twitch. You don't leave anything in your system do you? Kagami said with a deadpan expression. Abito just sneaked. Contestants ready. Both Rin and Anko nodded. Anko wore her purple clothes. While well, Rin wore the same clothes that she wore in the forest. Her face was covered with a mask while her head was covered with a hoodie. This cloth was made by Abito. And Rin lacked offensive capabilities, that's why she had to wear it like this. Also, Anko was known for using poison gas and other poison utility, this would help her in the fight. Then let the match begin. Rin and Anko started the fight immediately. Rin threw her shurikens at her, Anko did the same. Their attacks met in the middle as well Rin and Anko both threw hand seals, Anko finished first. I hope you don't have any hard feelings after I win. Biter up guys pushing her hands down onto the ground, her long sleeves summoned a magnitude of snakes. The snakes moved fast, slithering their way to Rin, who stood still. Rin ignored the snakes and slammed a scroll open on the ground, as water erupted from it. It not only washed away the snakes, but it flooded the arena, making the announcer jump to the wall to not get wet. But Anko wasn't lucky though, as she along with her snakes got swept away. But the snake summoner didn't have any time as she heard her opponent call out a jutsu. Water style. Water vine jutsu. Before Anko could get out of the water, something caught her ankle. Dragging her down even more as the girl struggled for air. Impressive, Kagami said looking down at the fight. Using a scroll to get the terrain to her advantage. Then using a simple jutsu to stop her opponent's movement. Of course it would I trained her, Kashina said proudly who joined them a few moments ago. She shouldn't be allowed as she didn't have any participating genin team under her. But who would stop her from entering anyway, she was the strongest Koichi in Kanoha. Now that Tsunade wasn't here, and she had quite the respect. And like Kagami, she didn't like to follow rules that stopped her. Sure you did, Kagami said rolling his eyes. Before his eyes widened. Wait, but I trained you. Doesn't that make me more awesome? Double awesome in fact. He said as if found gold. How humble of you. But can you guys stop, the fight's getting interesting. Down back at the fight, suddenly the water from the area where Anko was struggling erupted. And a large snake that was five times the size of a human was summoned. It wasn't a giant snake, but surely it was quite large and intimidating. Thanks, Tagi Anko said, panting for breath, I owe you one now let's show her our power. Anko commended her snake to move as she sat stood on its forehead. And as a chakra using beast, it could easily slither over water, without submerging its body into the water. Rin didn't sit still either, as she ran through hand signs of her own, before taking her blade in front. The water around came near her sword, making a twisting motion around it. And when it was finished it looked like a water whip. With that Anko kept the distance and attacked with her water whip. The snake was having a hard time getting near Rin, and Anko had to defend against the whip from hitting her or Tagi's head. 
This went on for a while before both sides knew the fight wasn't going anywhere. So Ang Cole lost patience and went through hand signs. Fire style. Fireball jutsu. But Rin smiled underneath her mask as she went through seals of her own, looking at the upcoming fireball. With the added water, casting water jutsu had gotten quite easier for her, with less chakra consumption. Abido had pointed out her lack of chakra reserves, and this was one of the ways to get some benefit for the water jutsus. Water style. Water wave jutsu. The water beneath Rin rose before attacking the fireball jutsu, creating steam that surrounded the area. With the cover of the steam, Rin moved quickly. And when it cleared, it was obvious who won. Rin was standing behind Anko with a sword on her neck. Aye aye, forfeit. Anko said. You go, girl Kashina cheered. Kagami and Minato also complimented the battle. Abito also liked the fight. Rin improved a lot, not dragging the fight and ending it quickly. And it was quite good. Though Abito was also a bit surprised about Anko's skills. She was rather skilled than he expected. Then again Orochimaru wouldn't just take anyone for his student. Speaking about Orochimaru, the man didn't even come for this part of the exam. Either he was experimenting in his lab or doing anything other than being here. Anyway, the next fight would be quite interesting as well. The next fight was between Asuman and Kenshi Yuzumaki. A Saratobi versus an Yuzumaki. Of course, Abido knew the Yuzumaki would win, but Asuma wasn't a bad shinobi either. Asuma readied himself, he was going to win this and impress Kurinai. The Saratobi was a bit jealous when he saw the Abido take care of his opponent with no effort, more so when he saw Kurinai getting impressed at the Acheha. Deep down Asuma knew that Kurani was a fangirl of Abido, and her redemption as a character had no return. Yet he refused to accept it. He was going to show off his awesome techniques that he's been practicing and impress her. It wasn't a question of if he could or not know, it was a must. He must win back the girl's heart. Wish me luck, Asuma said solemnly, as he jumped off from the second floor to the exam ground. Karani and his other teammate were cheering him on, but he would focus on the battle up ahead. Asuma might be not good as a Bido. But he knew the Yuzumaki he was facing was a strong opponent. Asuma was a sensor, not good as others, but he could judge people's strength with it, a quirk he got from his mother's side. Being a half Senju and a Saratobi, Asuma has quite a lot of chakra, but it dwarfed in comparison to the Yuzumakis. But that didn't make his resolve any less. He had an Yuzumaki to beat and a girl to impress. So, your name is Asuma Saratobi. Henshi Yuzumaki asked as he took out his katana. Are you by any chance related to the Hokage? You do seem to be from his clan and look quite strong. Asuma snorts, instead of replaying. He didn't like it very much when people recognized him because of his father. That's why he never trained like how his clanmates trained, he would forge his own path. Not following his father's. It might be his childish rebellious nature that made him act that way. He didn't need his father to be recognized. And he would be better than his father. Kenshi seeing no reply, just readied himself for the fight. Asuma did the same taking out his newly made knuckle blades, which he wore like brass knuckles, and its end having a one-sided blade. Let the match begin. Henshi and Asuma moved fast from the get-go. Clashing as sword collided with bladed knuckles. Sparks flew, as both contests sized each other out. The speed was something that the other genin surprised. It seemed all of Konoha's shinobis were all monsters. It also alerted Kisum and Zabuza about the Yuzumaki. As Kiri Shinobis they had a grudge against the Yuzumaki village, not coming under Kiri, but allying with Kanoha. And now there was a prodigy among them. And that didn't sit well with them. The fight between the two contestants started getting intense. And that is when Kisum spoke. We shouldn't let him get back to his village. He said, in a whisper. We can get much merit if we can kill someone with that much talent, and in Yuzumaki no less. Zabuza nodded, his eyes cold. He's strong, but we will have to lay low for a while. He said. And also, I don't know if our sensei will let us do it or not. Kissum snorts, that weakling is a coward. We should kill him while we are at it. He said with a laugh. He's holding us back anyway. Zabuza joined in with a chuckle as well. Asuma was getting pushed as the fight continued more and more. So he jumped back, gaining some distance to get catch his breath. What the but of course the Yuzumaki abused his stamina advantage, and didn't let Asuma rest. His attack became faster as he saw Asuma tiring out. 
The Saratobi clicked his tongue and pushed Wind Chakra into his knuckle blades, creating a blue hue around it. And his slashes went faster. Asuma knew in a battle of strength and stamina he will lose, so he wanted to finish it as fast as possible. Strikes fell on each other, getting countered by each other. And Asuma finally saw a chance and moved up to take advantage of it. Going through his hand signs, fire release. Ash burning wave. The ash came out of Asuma's mouth and got ignited right over Kenshi's body. The Saratobi finally caught his breath, but it was far from over. As his instincts screamed at him to move. And he rolled to the side as a whip attacked where he was previously, creating the ground beneath it. Da fak. Asuma could only say one curse, before the whip followed him, and attacked his chest. The boy was thrown off balance, and a wound appeared on his chest. Now that Ozma was a bit far, he could finally see what was happening. He was attacked by a whip, but it was no ordinary whip, no it was a water whip similar to the one Rin used. That technique of yours did catch me off guard for a bit. But my technique is better, it's not a mere copy of the original Kenshi said, with a small smile on his face. Glancing right where Rin was standing, before looking back at his opponent. I'm kinda impressed on how strong Shinobis and Kanoha are. Back in Yuzu, I barely get to let loose like this. But I hope you're up for round two. Asuma was panting, but he couldn't just show his weakness to his enemies. Believe me, tomato boy, I can do this all day. Trying to play it cool, not knowing it would backfire on him. But it had other effects on making Kenshi a bit annoyed. Asuma woke up suddenly, looking around, he found himself in the medical ward. So so he lost. After Kenshi used that water whip, he was up to his mercy. He didn't have any long distance jutsu that could be fast enough to hit the Yuzumaki before he could dodge. And so he lost. He didn't even register how he got knocked off. But one thing he realized was that he was weak. And and he felt so powerless. Not only was that damn Abito stronger than him, but now kids from other villages were stepping over him like cannon folders. He refused to accept that. His hands gritted with determination. How did he you lack awareness as a shinobi Kagami said bluntly, making the Saratobi feel a sting in his heart. And you only frown over women. I I I don't only train for Kurinai. He stumbled in his words. Oh, so it's that her name. Kagami hummed, rubbing his chin, making the Saratobi bit his lips, as to why he spoke like that. Shinku's daughter huh? I should let him know. With that, he started to leave. Saratobi stumbled out from his bed. Kagami san wait, but he was too injured to stand, and the wound on his chest burned in pain. The Achiha stood at the doorway. You wouldn't you won't tell, right? Asuma wasn't new to it. Kagami was like an uncle to him, an annoying uncle. So he kinda knew about his quirk of putting things down bluntly. That's why he tried to avoid interacting with his father's friend, well, all of his friends, except Rifu, maybe. He was the only one that seemed normal, and not even mention the one called Danzo. That man looked like he had a rod stuck up on his ass as a kid, and no one pulled it out. So in a way, he was glad it wasn't Danzo he was seeing right now. Huh, and why shouldn't I? Bugami said, spinning around all serious, and kneeling to young Asuma's height. I mean, he would be delighted to have her daughter be frowned over by the Hokage's second son. Even though it was right and might be factual. Asuma felt a sting in his chest, with a mixed expression of burning pride and annoyance. Kagami sees the iron hot and strikes again. I mean that's all you have going for. Why you take it back? I don't need my father's shadow looming over me on every occasion in my life. Asuma said, stupid old man doesn't even look tough. Why do I have to be recognized because of his achievements? I will make my own. Kagami chuckled. Let me ask you, boy. Do you know why Hiruzen is called the strongest cage in this generation? Asuma looked at him, a bit confused and curious. He didn't have the immense power of the first Hokage, or the knowledge to ask pull jutsu like the second sensei. Yet he is still recognized as the strongest cage, even though there are freaks powerful in all other villages. Why? Why is that let me tell you why? So Asuma listened. Why was his father, the third Hokage called the strongest cage of this generation? What did he do? Do you know of Ginkaku and Kinkaku? Well, pretty straightforward he killed them in battle in one on one. I mean one and two. But you get the gist of it. With that not only he showed his strength to the world, but also avenged Sensei. Asuma was wide-eyed. He didn't know of that. It was never mentioned in the history books. 
and everyone knew Kinkaku and Gakaku, they were responsible for killing the second Hokage. He didn't have any fancy eyes, Kagami said, rhetorically pointing at his own eyes. Or other powerful abilities like Kakajenki no, what he had was a monkey stick and determination. And he is considered the strongest in Konoha. I don't care I just don't want to live in my father's shadow anymore. Asuma said. Kagami chuckled. Oh, I know that my pep talk doesn't work well on your kind. Hiruzen was quite like you in your age, chasing after women but also strength. Your mother did iron out the first flaw though. Kagami mumbled to himself. Anyhow, a monkey that can't be trained, can be tricked, is what they say. The Achiha hums, as a twisted scary grin appeared on his face. Making Asuma feel cold all of a sudden. Prove to me that you can grow strong in a short amount of time. And I won't mistakenly tell my colleague Shinku Iki about your crush life. Mistakenly. You monster. Asuma felt horrified. You wouldn't. Mistakenly, I mean I wouldn't be a sour puss and ruin your love life. Kagami said, standing up, as he got to the door, before stopping at the door frame yet again. You know you have also talent within you. But you are just too stubborn about it. Asuma knew what Kagami meant. He didn't use or learn how the usual members of the Saratobi trained. He would train his own way, not follow the path set up by his clan members. But it also meant, falling short on tricks he could use. He only knew a few Saratobi Jutsus, and didn't even gain the Monkey Scroll contract, because of his stubbornness. Maybe if maybe if he trained that way, this match might be won by him. Listen Asuma, I don't care what route you chose. But know this what good will your pride do if in a crucial moment, your loved ones are killed because of your lack of strength. Kagami said, making Asuma's eye widen. We are not in peaceful times anymore. You should know that I hope you choose to become strong rather than remain weak and stroke your pride with false bravado. It will only get your friends killed. But that Kagami left the room, leaving a frozen Saratobi to think about his mistakes. Outside a certain older Saratobi listened to the conversation and smiled softly. He didn't need to say anything. With that Hiruzen also left, not meeting his son. Sometimes it's better to let the green leaves find their own answers themselves. Abito yawned as the last match finished. It was between Ku the son of Thuchikij and another unlucky shinobi from a minor village. It was finished in seconds. Guy's match was also with another Kanoha shinobi, who stood no chance of winning. And funny enough the last match was between the two Yuzumaki twins. The girls fought it off, one winning over the other barely. So with that, the Chunin exam was over. With that, we conclude the second round of the exam. The announcer said, those who passed, please get ready for the third round that will happen in a week. It was a time of war, usually, the third round would happen in a month. But due to the upcoming war, it was speeding up. Not that it mattered. The daimyo from the other villages were already coming to Kanoha. And a week might be a short time, but in the world of Shinobi, where giant animal summons exist, making long trips aren't that time-consuming. Also keeping foreign shinobis for too long in the village won't do them any good. Anyhow, Abito wanted to be over with the exam. He knew after the war, things could get rough. And it would be even worse for Yuzushi Agakur, and he wanted to stop that. There was multiple reasons why he wanted to save the Yuzumaki village. And the main one was because of their sealing arts. As a seal master himself, he knew how valuable the sealing arts were. Every sealing matrix was improved on by the latter. And with how tough it was to decipher the sealing matrix of the Uzumakis, if their village was lost, it would be detrimental. He knew there was no Aotsutsuki in the world. But that didn't mean after Madara there wouldn't be future threats. And having a bunch of Uzumakis in Kanoha would help it. Why fight powerful enemies when you could just seal them away? Abido didn't see any other way except the merging of the two villages. The Uzumakis would have to leave their home and come to Kanoha if they wanted to survive. And that was the main problem. Would the Yuzushikage let it happen? Probably not. And it wasn't a thing like the Chudoku clan, so he would need official help. When he first got into the world, he had a few goals in mind. And one of them was to save the Yuzumaki clan from extinction along with his own clan. And it was also the right thing to do, even with how grey his morality was. And also because of Kashina, she was the first friend he had coming into this world. So, but he was stopped when got outside the building. Hey, what are you thinking, little man? You're going to fry your brain at this rate. 
A voice said with amusement, it was Kagami. Where was he anyway, he left after Asuma's match. Meh, he didn't care. Don't you have shinobi duties to attend to? Abito gave the elder Ichiha a stink eye, go bother some other kids. Kagami chuckled, shaking his head, before placing a hand over his shoulder. Come to training ground for at the evening. I have something to show you. He said, smiling, but there was a trace of sadness in his eyes. And with that, the man left. Abito was a bit confused, but he could meet him there. He could also get some training done with him. The training with Sharingan worked better against a Sharingan user. And only a few Sharingan users could give him a challenge. Hmm, what should I do? He thought, I can't kill Kisum and Zabuza until the exam was over. So I might as well, spend some time training the new summoner. He still remembered the shock he felt when he saw the Grand Lady of the Bats telling him about the new summoner about the bats. She had selectively chosen her, a shinobi from the Hidden Sand to be the next bat summoner. And Abito had no problems with this. Because the new summoner was Pakura. Yes, the same Pakura with the Scorch style. Also, the girl was a bit older than him, but wasn't loyal to the Hidden Sand or anything like that. She was much more interested to kill Zabuza and kiss him for what they had done to her and her teammates. And she had requested to kill them, in the most horrifying way possible. Of course, Abito accepted the requested. If he could make Pakura loyal to the Bat Clan, but extension himself, killing future threats was no problem. Abito could sympathize with a girl. She had no family back in the Sand Village, and her team was her only friends there. And now they were gone. Abito didn't kill people willy-nilly if he could try to avoid it. Because at the end of the day they also had their lives and family. Yet when the war starts he would have to push aside those feelings and become a killing machine. He didn't like it. And he promised to change it, when he had the power. For now, Pakur was living in the Bat Cave located in the Land of Tea. Abito or anyone in the clan could go between the two Bat Caves with ease. The Kura was very much welcomed into the Chudoku village, but she was still trying to manage in. Kakura knew Scorch style. And when he asked her, she showed him the ability. It was a pure bloodline ability, unlike magnate release or particle release, it couldn't be passed down by teaching. But the blend of two chakra natures helped Abito in better combine fire and wind chakra natures. Abito also got the technique down for the earth release lightweight rock technique, and he was able to use it with some difficulty. He was trying to use the same theory to recreate the earth release. Added weight technique. If he could learn it it will help him very much with his tajutsu. Of course, he could just go to Ku and beat the techniques out of him. But it might create problems if he tried anything right now. But once they left the Kanoha borders, he could try it. He already had fire, wind, and earth release under his belt. He wanted to know if he could recreate the technique. Abito got out of his lab. He couldn't do much research, but it was worth jolting down a few notes, reviewing the ceiling matrix, planting the cells gathered from the Judoku clan within it, and other complicated stuff. Abito knew about the curse mark from Canon. But there weren't any methods leading around from where he could learn it. So he had to make the curse mark from scratch. And that meant a lot of work. For now, he was trying to create the curse mark with a ceiling matrix derived from the storage scroll jutsu. And it had an odd benefit. But that was for later. He could tell he was very close to creating the curse mark, but didn't know if the first curse mark would be successful or not. And also he would have to find a few humans or better shinobis to exp- but that was a problem for later. When he first started creating the curse mark, the old lady of the bats didn't offer any help. And he didn't ask either, but it was taking too long. So he asked her for help. The old bat wanted the new summoner of the bats, Pakura to be trained in the bat ways. And Abido will help with that, in return, the old bat would help him in creating the curse mark. And with her help, Abido was sure he could get a working curse mark by the time the war started. And he could perfect the curse seal there on the battlefield. His curse mark would also be different, he didn't want to take on the form of a snake, or even worse a bat. He just needed the benefits of Sage Mode without the disgusting transformation ability. So that meant he would need to work with that as well. And seeing that Arachimaru in the cannon couldn't do it, it might be hard as well. Huh, I have a lot of things to do. Abito thought, before going for his first ask. The Achiha gets inside the village and starts looking for someone. It was Rin. Abito sighs, wow, what a good teammate I am not even knowing where she lives. 
He mumbled, but it wasn't a problem though, when the Ichiha remembered he could just find her with his sensing. And after a few searches, he found her. But not in the residential areas, no she was in one of the training grounds. Abido quickly goes there and finds who's he looking for. And she was training. Abido didn't reveal himself immediately but stayed quiet observing her training. Rin was panting on the ground, her clothes soaked. The training ground had a small lake near it, and most of it looked destroyed, with craters on the ground. Abido really was impressed. She was still training hard. But then it hit him. Even though Abido wasn't paying too much attention in Asuma's match against Kenshi. He did a one-time look at Rin, saying something about copying Yuzumaki's moves. It did make sense. Rin was trained by Kashina. And she was using a few Yuzumaki Jutsus that shouldn't be allowed for outside people to use. Kashina might have taught Rin just despite the Yuzumaki elders. But it also ticked off the little Yuzumaki Kenshi. And when he said that Rin copied their moves, she felt insulted and hurt perhaps. Well, he wouldn't know. If someone said he was copying their move, he would take it as a compliment. But he was just built differently. But seeing Rin just about to use calling each of them. And creating a giant burst of water around the training ground. Wow, you pulled off the water dragon jutsu to only five signs. Abito said, impressive. He said coolly. Did you really have to make an entrance like that? Rin said with a sweat drop. Other girls might have been impressed by Abito's odd way of antics. But Rin was almost accustomed to his antics. But he was cool with how he entered, but it's not like she would ever tell him that. Come on you should be charmed by now. Abito chuckled, before taking out a scroll and tossing it to her. Which the Kanoichi grabbed mid-air, with a questioning look. Well, you will be right now. Open it. And she did. And her jaw almost dropped to the floor when she finally opened the full scroll. There were three A-rank Jutsu there, and not to mention the last one, as the last one is Ceiling Matrix. Rin asked wide-eyed, before looking at Abido. From the Clam Clan no less. But don't they only take summoners from the Hezeki Clan of Kiri? Abido chuckled. I know I'm awesome. How how did you get that? I managed to get it somehow, don't ask how. But if someone does ask, tell them they sought you out. Abido couldn't make contact with other summoning clans, with already being a summoner of the bats. But he did use the ceiling matrix that he gathered from the mist corpse to summon one of the clams. The clam was confused as to why and how a non-summoner could summon them. But Abido made up a bullshit story of finding their scrolls deep underground in a waterfall, near a skeleton. They were a bit confused. But it was possible. It was very common in this world to get summoning contracts of dead bodies. Also, Abido didn't want to tell them that he killed a few of their Hazuki summoners. Of course, they wouldn't know it was Abido, because of how young he was, and also they weren't summoned to the battle. So Abido asked them if would take summoners in Kanoha. And they were elated to do so. The Clam Clan didn't like the Hazuki hogging summoning contract for themselves, as they wanted to spread out their influence, so they were happy as well. They even offered Abido to make a contract with them, him being an Ichiha and all. A few of their clams could use fire release. But of course, Abido declined and told them he could find a better candidate for them. So that's why he wanted to give her the scroll. Though the clam clan would test her if she was worthy of being their summoner. But that was up to her to accomplish. I I don't know what to say. Rin looked flabbergasted and speechless. You could say a thank you. Abido chuckled seeing the girl that way and started teasing her. If he had known he could get this reaction out of her, he would have done that just for the reaction. Abido walked the streets of Kanoha in a good mood. He loved teasing Rin like that. It was almost addicting. Now he had nothing else to do. Should he go back to the lab? Kagami told him to meet in the evening so he had a bit of time. So, Abido decided to chill a bit. He hadn't had Raymond for five days now. And so Abido went for his Raymond recharge. Is anyone there? Abido asked, as he entered the shop. Only seeing little A.M. and another person. The Achiha blinked, I didn't expect to see you here. The shinobi that was enjoying his lunch suddenly turned to Abido. Of if it isn't the Achiha prodigy. I thought you were in the Chunin exams. I am in it. The second round ended this morning, and the third round will be a week. But I didn't think you would come back from your mission so early. Of course, I didn't know that either. The shinobi said, being none other than Yukai Kohinata. The non-Huga by Akugan user. But I am glad that I'm here. 
I mean I've been out of the village for almost six months, and not to mention that I can finally see the Chunin exam. Abito raised an eyebrow. He seemed excited to excited. Abito and Mukai trained quite a lot with Guy and Dai. So they knew each other's antics. Mukai stood up and patted Abito's shoulder. If you want any tips. I as your senior will lend you some help. I'm a Jonin after all. He said with a smug expression. Abito felt his eyebrow twitch and pushed of Mukai's hand. Like I would need help from you. And when the fuck did you become a Jonin? Mukai puffed up his chest a bit. Even though he was older than Abito, he still had his antics. I got field promotion by one of the Hokage's personal advisors. And Abito was wide-eyed a bit, Danzo. Mukai blinked, why ya, yeah, how did you know that Abito bit his lips, he had stopped Mukai from joining the Anbu. But that didn't mean Danzo would just let a talent like Mukai get out of his grasp. This was bad, but for now he couldn't do anything. He already stopped Mukai once from joining. Nothing, Abito said, seeing no way he could stop his friend. He would need to do something to either make Mukai not join Danzo, or to make the Shimura elder lose interest in him. You know I just remembered something why don't you enjoy another bowl of ramen. It's on me. And I will get back to you later. He said, putting down a few coins on the table before exiting. Abito knew about Danzo, even though he wasn't the same one from canon. He knew about all the research he was doing with Arachimaru. And so his character wasn't much different. He would need to get Mukai of his hooks, but for now he couldn't do anything. Abito left, not in the mood for Raymond. He had some extra time, but he could just go to the training ground early and think there. The Ichiha had a lot of things in mind, as he went there. He was an hour or so early, so seeing no way to get things of his mind, he decided to practice the Earth release. Lightweight Jutsu. The same one he had copied with his Sharingan. Now he wanted to see if he could use it. The technique was quite hard, even for a good chakra user like Abito. But he could levitate for a bit. He just needed more practice with it if he wanted to use it in battle. Well, I didn't expect you to be so early, and practice that technique it was none other than Kagami's voice. And he was quite surprised. Your talent for copying stuff really is amazing compared to other Ichihas. Abito grinned, of course it is. I'm just awesome. Kagami chuckled. The main question is why are you learning that flying technique? You do have something similar with your Tujutsu. Abito shook his head. I have got a feeling that I will face against that rock humper in the exam. So I'm going to show off a bit. And who knows I might use it well with my Tujutsu if I can learn it. Kagami just laughed. You really like to show off don't you? Abita rolled his eyes, hey, it's my job. I'm the trump card for Kanoha in this exam. He said, anyway, why did you call me here? Kagami sighed, suddenly becoming serious. Follow me. We can't speak here. With that the crow summoner left, Abito just following behind. Kagami stopped, they were on the top of the Hokage Mountain. A place where Abito liked to visit a lot. It was a peaceful place, the calm feeling of the wind blowing, and looking down at the village at whole was quite an experience. So why did you bring me here, Abito said, but he was cut off when Kagami looked at him in the eye, his Sharingan flashing. But it was no ordinary Sharingan, no it was his man Jekyo. A unique pattern and Abito knew he was in his Jinjutsu. And why did you do that really? Abito asked, with a raised eyebrow. He was inside Kagami's Jinjutsu. It looked like they were still in Konoha, but it was eerily calm. Humor me, Kagami said, but his voice was serious. As he took a stance, before flinging kunais at him. Abito quickly body flickered to the side, and started throwing his own kunais. Each one deflected the other, as all of the kunais made a pile on the ground. But it wasn't over, Abito moved, suddenly when he felt a presence behind him. And he was kicked in his side, making the boy fly a few meters. It was Kagami no there were multiple of them. And all of them took out their tantos. Blue chakra running through them. I hope you are ready. All of them said as they hoarded Abito with attacks from all sides. The young Ichiha cursed, he couldn't summon his bat clones for some reason in the Jinjutsu world. But Abito wasn't intimidated, no he was thrilled. He was up for the challenge, it's been too long since he spared with Kagami. Even if it was just using Jinjutsu. Abito moved and unlocking to his fourth gate as he used his armament rods to plow through the Kagami Crow clones. With his Sharingan active and his fourth gate open, he could keep up with the clones, even if they seemed infinite in number. 
It went on for a while before Ibido started losing stamina. But the boy grinned, he knew how things worked with Kagami. Unless one of them falls, it will continue. He was preparing another round with the clones when they all disappeared, leaving behind one Kagami. Let's finish this quickly. He said, as his eyes flashed to his man Jekyo. Abito also removed his shades, they were broken anyway when he was fighting the clones. And how his Sharingan flared up. And both of them moved at the same time. Flashing in between, armament rods against Tanto. Sparks were flying as they danced on the battlefield, each hit deadlier than before. But it soon became obvious that Kagami was better. And a kick to the gut, Abito was thrown away, getting stopped by cruising into a boulder, creating cracks on the earth formation. Ah oh, that one hurt. The small Ichiha mumbled as he kept his eye on his sensei. You are still holding back old man. Go all out, I want to see what gap I need to cross. Kagami didn't say anything, but Abito could see a trace of a smile on his face. Very well then. Red chakra erupted out of him, as it started taking shape, first it crawled out like vines, and started forming a skeleton, before it got covered. And Abido could see it the red gigantic monster with its yellow eyes staring down at him. This is the true power of the Sharingan. Abido was amazed and terrified at the same time. The man-made chakra formation was huge and intimidating, it was fucking diabolical. It was getting even hard for Abido to breathe with how much pressure he was releasing. But Abido grinned nonetheless. So this was the power he was shooting for. The true power of Manjekyo. Whoever came up with the idea of bringing Megazords into the Shinobi world was out of his mind. But he wasn't complaining. Six gate of view open, Abido said, the chakra in his body turned green. As Abido took a running position, while the red chakra construct took out its blade and held it up high. Abido knew this wouldn't be enough, and it was a risky move. But he wanted to try. The Ichiha calmed his mind, and his breathing pattern changed, as he started looking for a sensation to tap into. And it was there, the burning desire to set loose. And Abido tapped into that power. The green aura around his body started getting red sparks mixed into it. And the veins around his body started to bulge, his neck veins, the veins around his face, and arms all were visible as they pumped blood and chakra. The whites in his eyes even started to bleed right along with his Sharingan, as the three tomes spun in succession. And created steam out of it. Abido wasn't slacking off his training. After many failed attempts, he could somewhat use the power. Though it drained his stamina like a bitch. The small Ichiha gritted his teeth, he could almost feel his body cracking with power. He only had one move. And he was going to make it count. Abido's hands started to heat up, as he started moving them to his side at fast speed, as more sparks gathered there, creating flames made out of something other than chakra. And like before both the giant creature under Kagmai's control and Abido using his newfound power moved, his hands out in front, while the giant sword dropped on him. Creating a large explosion around the area. Abido snapped out of the Jinjutsu falling on his knees, panting. He could barely breathe, still, a small smile was on his face. His body was still shaking from the Jinjutsu battle. His brain wrecking itself on the wounds that were never real. With difficulty, Abido looked up. Kagami was there smiling with his manjekyo active. You really outdid yourself, kid, Kagami said, walking towards him, before sitting on the floor. But sorry to say I have to say something to you. And for that, I can't speak openly. The crow summoner spoke, eyes darting around. Abido raised an eyebrow, but knew what he meant, so he nodded. Kagami put Abido in another jinjutsu. This time only to speak to each other, not to fight. Is there any reason why you can't speak openly? Abido asked, now that he was back in the Jinjutsu world, he felt a bit curious as to why Kagami was taking so many precautions. Kagami sighed, well, the stuff I am about to share with you is top secret. So that's why I don't want any onlookers. Abido raised an eyebrow, but nodded nonetheless okay. So, first I want to ask you how much you know about the Manjekyo. Not a lot. But I kinda got some info cause of my bat summons. They were in the area before Kanoha even was a village. So they gave me some of the hand info. Abido was of course lying. But that didn't matter. Kagami nodded. Before going in department explaining about the Manjekyo. But, there was no mention of other eye abilities. Meaning he didn't get anything like Sasuke Itachi. Abido was kinda concerned as to why Kagami called him. 
but his worries were for none, as Kagami only wanted to explain about his manjekyo. It wasn't his first time seeing Kagami's manjekyo either, heck, Kagami showed his eyes to him back when he was participating in the Achiha Fire Festival. Now we came to the part where it affects most Kagami said. And that is. How to obtain the manjekyo. It said that you have to kill one of your loved ones to awaken it. Kagami said seriously. Nah I think that's bullshit. I know it is. Kagami said, making a beetle blink. What do you mean? How did you gain your eyes exactly? Kagami smiled, I obviously didn't need to kill anyone to get my eyes. He said, but there was a bit of sadness to it. But, I awakened them when saw my sensei's body. I felt so helpless that a new power awakened within me. And my eyes changed. Abito nodded. It was similar to Shisui, seeing someone you love or care about die can awaken your eyes. But then something hit Abito. The small Ichiha narrowed his eyes, we aren't having this conversation because you suspect I will kill someone to gain power. Is it? Kagami smiled again, actually that's the reason. I have seen some talented Ichiha kill their teammates or friends to awaken the eyes. But failed. So I don't want you to go through that. You know I am actually glad and mad at the same time. Glad that you didn't want me to suffer because of my stupidity. And mad that you thought I was that stupid in the first place. Kagami just laughed. Abita rolled his eyes, also you are losing your eyesight aren't you, that stopped the older Ichiha's laugh. Come on one of our Ichiha elders is blind, and he was supposed to have the manjekyo when he was at his peak. You don't need to be a genius to connect the dots. You are right, sadly. My eyesight isn't getting ruined day by day, but only when I use my manjekyo abilities. I don't know how much time before I am fully blinded myself. Kagami said, but when he looked up, Abito was grinning. You know what why don't you come over to my lab in the hospital to get checked up? I might be able to cure your blindness or stop its deterioration. You just want to know what differences are there between the normal Sharingan and the Manjekyo don't you? He said with a bland expression. Oh, you know me too well. But I am serious about your cure. I don't know if I will succeed or not. But I can try. Kagami shrugged. Make sure that none of that information leaves your hands. Abito nodded. Oh, I will. Don't want future enemies knowing about your trump card. Kagami rolled his eyes, he was about to cancel his Jinjutsu, but Abito stopped him. Hey, can I ask you for a favor? He said, I was thinking of gaining some freedom after the Chunin exams, and the old man shouldn't mind promoting me directly to a Jonin. So can you do something for me? Kagami shrugged. Let's hear it, and this right here is the Hokage Mountain, or top of it at least, Abito said, smiling as the warmth of the sunlight hit his skin. And of course for me it's the most beautiful place I have ever seen. You should see the sunset from here, it's truly beautiful. You can really see the whole village from here. A redeeded girl said with awe as she looked at the horizon. Momoka, don't go to the side, you might fall. Said another redeeded girl, she looked exactly like the other one. Of course, they were the twin sister Yuzumaki that came from Yuza Shigakur. Mio, you worry too much. Her sister replied, rolling her eyes, knowing full well that her sister had a bad fear of heights. It looks beautiful from here doesn't it, Kenshi? It is Kenshi nodded. Like always the boy was pretty quiet for an Yuzumaki. He held himself with grace and spoke little. With his charming face and dignified attitude he held himself like the clan heir he was. You know for an Yuzumaki you are really quiet. Abito said, did you hit your head when you were born? A Goku situation going on or something. The last part was mostly said to himself. And Yuzumaki that was clam and quite was the unthinkable. And she chuckled, but I could say the same for you, for in Achiha you are very talkative. Abito made a face, oh, come on. I wanted a reaction. The two girls laughed at the casual moment. They were a bit surprised when Abito asked them to give them a tour of Konoha. As Yuzumakis, they were mostly outspoken and extroverts, but people often didn't like that behavior. And Ichiha clan was known for being stuck-ups. So they were very surprised when got to know Abito. He seemed almost as outspoken as Yuzumakis and would joke around all the stuff. So they were very glad that Abito gave them a tour of Konoha. Of course, they knew it had a bit of politics involved. Maybe the Hokage or someone from his clan told him to do so, but that didn't take away the genuineness of the moment. Also, Abito was the golden child of Ichiha, and he being the student of the Yuzumaki princess, made them a bit comfortable. 
Kishina was also very happy that a part of her family came to Kanoha. But for reasons, she was avoiding them. Of course, Abito knew why. Anyway, something surprising was Kenshi Sensei didn't come for the exams, because of shinobi shortage back in their village. That was also the reason why Abito wanted to ease them down a bit. Though he was requested by Hiruzen to do so. Even though Kanoha was an Alay the Yuzumaki nation, it was still foreign. So how's Yuzu? Abito asked. Kenshi hummed, it's doing well. You should visit it sometimes, it's doing well. Abito said, raising an eyebrow. From what I know, it's in shambles after the recent attack from Kiri. Kenshi shot Abito a look, frowning at the same time. It's not that bad that being a lie. But Abito didn't press any further. Abito rolled his shoulders, whatever you say, he said, shrugging, anyway, I don't know if I should be the one asking you this, but why is Kashina sensei avoiding you guys? Aren't you guys family or something? Momoka and Mio perked up looking at Abito and Kenshi. They knew the reason why. Kenshi sighed, well, it's something to do with her marriage. You should know she's trying to marry one of your other senseis. And father and the elders of the clan aren't accepting of that. Oh, so stinky old man diving their noses in other people's lives. Typical clan elder behavior, sometimes I wonder if they were all trained by the same one. Abito snorted. Please don't tell me you support my sister's decision. Kenshi asked with a raised eyebrow. He seemed amused. The man is not only an outsider, but he's clanless. I mean he just shook his head. A wild young master apper Zabito looked at Kenshi, before bursting into a fit of laughter. Okay, this is seriously funny. But do you even know who Minato is? He's called the Yellow Flash of Kanoha. The man that figured out the Flying Thunder God no Jutsu, the only disciple of the Toad Sage Jiraiya, and a perfect sage himself at that age, he would rather say Kashina was the one that lucked out, finding the hidden gem. Kenshi shook his head, Abita my friend, we might not see eye to eye on this matter. But I still think my cousin is making a foolish decision here. He said, with a sigh of disappointment. Their child would only have half of Yuzumaki potential. Now Abito lost it, in his laughter. What's so funny? Kenshi asked, while he rolled his eyes. He couldn't imagine how Abito and him aren't seeing eye to eye on this matter. You. The redeed rolled his eyes. Fine, but you will see. I'm usually right on this stuff. Abito just shook his head. It was pretty funny to him. But it seemed that Kenshi here held some narrow-minded view. Well, I will get back to some work. Abito said, I will pick you guys at tomorrow noon. Yeah, about that I don't think we should do that. Kenshi said, feeling a bit awkward. We stick out as a thumb as it is. We visiting the Achiha ground, might be a bit oh, come on, Kenny Kenny. We red-eye people are very kind to our red-headed brotherin. And I'm sure you will love it there. Unless of course you have other plans. Fine. Kenshi sighed, putting his hands up in the air. You win. But I would rather have a sparing session with you than doing all of this. Abito just smiled. That's only for the exams, mister. I'm banned from fighting or sparing with other shinobis outside the village, while the exam is still going on. Kenshi shrugged. Fine. But be prepared to lose. You are really getting better with your jokes. The third round of the Chunin exam started. Abito waited with the other contestants, it was good that his whole team made it to the finals. Anyhow, Abito was getting bored. In the recent few days, he was getting quite bored. He couldn't leave the village to test out the trail version of the curse marks, and he couldn't find any ideas to spend his time in. Though he did create something out of sheer boredom. And it was quite the product. He still needed to put the finishing touch on it. And the last eight members joined the ring. Henshi, Abito, Guy, Rin, Kissam, Zabuza, Ku, and Dadar all joined the empty ring, it was an open field. Up above the galleries were filled with villagers wanting to see and enjoy the exams. There was supposed to be 10 members joining in the Chunin exams, but the last two were Momoka and Mio, the twin Yuzumaki sisters decided to quit the finals, as they didn't want to get heavily injured, and wanted to enjoy the time here. Also, they just wanted to be on the safer side, if Kenshi got injured in the exams. The girls could take care of him. The Yuzumaki sisters were also gifted on the medical side of things. Now we will begin the final round of the Chunin exam. The examiner said. The matches will be completely random, please pick a card from the white box. After everyone did. The matchup was set. 
Abido vs. Abusa, Rin vs. Kissam, Guy vs. Kenshi, Ku vs. Dadara, every matchup seemed to be good. Except for the last one, Abido wanted to fight Ku, but fighting Zabuza was also good. Poor thing won't see daylight anymore though. Abido internally mused. Well, I did take Pakura's job, might as well do it with style. Hum should I call her to watch it? Yeah, let's do that she's training with the grand lady anyway, she could take the break and get some inspiration. Abido summoned one of his bats and sent it to Pakura with a massage. The grand lady should have a way to bring her to watch the show without getting noticed. The first match will begin shortly, you will be given 5 minutes to prepare. The announcer said, as all of the contest got off the stage. Only Zabuza stood there aing Abido for a bit, before going back to his corner. Am I late here isn't? An old man asked, he was of course the fire daimyo. And he took a seat in one of the chairs, right on the Hokage's side. Daimyo-sama you are just on time. Hiruzen smiled, standing up to greet the old man. This was the first fire daimyo that was living since Hashirama's time, now he was getting quite old. Soon his son would take over his position. Yet Hiruzen respected the man. Unlike the other daimyos the fire daimyo was competent. Speaking of other daimyos, all the other daimyo from the four major villages also came, sitting on their seats. There was even some minor village daimyo that came here. Some bringing in special bodyguards with them, while others came alone. The fire daimyo also came with one of his attendants, a Konoha shinobi from the Nara clan. But the man didn't join seeing the fight. He would rather spend time resting and meeting his family while he was in the village. I hope to see the new talents of Konoha. The fire daimyo said. I'm sure you will be impressed, Hiruzen said while the older man nodded. Don't get your hopes up, Anoki said, he was one of the two cages that came to the exam. This year I'm sure our village will win. Ho 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 is it because your son is also in the exam? The stone daimyo asked the stone cage. Anoki just smirked. The third Mizukage also sitting on his side didn't say anything. But there was an odd red-haired girl that came along with him as his assistant. One that looked very similar to an Yuzumaki. Hiruzen didn't look worried, on the other hand, he looked back to the shinobi that came with him as a temporary assistant, signaling him to come near. It was Minato. The yellow flash of Kanoha seemed a bit awkward with all of the big people, coming from a civilian background and all. But he will have to deal with it if Hiruzen wanted to pass the hat to him. Hiruzen then whispered something in Minato's ear. Tell Ibido to not kill Anki's kid if he meets him in the exam rounds. Minato nodded and quickly disappeared from his spot, before coming back again. Of course, Anoki heard that and was irritated. Come on Tsunade, it will be fun. We are in the village already, let's watch the exams. Outside a certain toad sage trying to plead to a beautiful blonde lady. No, I'm here to only see grandma. Now that that's done, I'm leaving, Tsunade said, as she was trying to leave. Leaving are we? Kakashi stopped the blonde right in her tracks. I expect nothing less from you, cousin. He snorted, before going away with the body flicker. Don't leave me behind, senpai. An Ichiha kid followed the son of the white fang as he went. I also want to see the exams. And who's the blonde ugly anyway of course it was Shisui. But Jiraiya felt a hand grab onto his head, and for some reason, he started sweating. And he didn't do anything wrong this time. Let's go see the exams, she said, irritation and anger in her voice. From the side Shizun sweat dropped. The time was given to make last minute preparations, and also because a few of the daimyos were late to join the Chunin exams. The exams were basically a dick measuring contest between the villages to show that their shinobis were better than the rest. And so after waiting, the announcer was given the signal to begin the matches. Abido Ichiha and Zabuza Mamachi, please come to the stage. Both the Kanoha Shinobi and Kirinin joined. Any form of weapon will be allowed, killing is allowed. And outside help is prohibited. If I see any reason I can and will intervene to stop the match. You understand? The announcer asked. Well both of them nodded. Now the first match of the final round of the Chunin exam, begin. With that, the announcer disappeared. Abido and Zabuza didn't move standing their ground. Huh, too scared to move, but Zabuza was interrupted. You know we didn't come here to exchange monologues, Abido said, yawning, while he acted casual. Zabuza was a bit irritated that he was cut off, but he didn't care. He grabbed his large broadsword from his back and brought it forward. Only to not find Abido. 
The Acheha had disappeared. Cool sword, Abito said, making the Kiri Shinobi spook out. As he jumped to the side. When did the Acheha come near him, he couldn't even trace him. Seeing Zabuza first read it, Abito chuckled. You know the match might be boring if I use all my power, Abito mumbled, too low for the audience to hear, but just enough for Zabuza. But then again, life isn't fair. So deal with it. Just try not to die too quickly, I do need to put on a show for the fat fox over there. The Ichiha chuckled, closing his eyes, before opening them. His Sharingan spinning in his eyes, it looked majestic. And for a fraction of a second Zabuza made eye contact with Abido. But the Mist Shinobi was unaware, as he quickly looked away, not wanting to fall into the Ichiha's Jinjutsu. The Ichiha of course wound show all of his techniques. Especially his bat clones, they were his trump card to get a leg up on his opponents. No need to show them when outsiders from the village are here. Abito moved first, taking out two of his flamed kunai as he attacked Zabuza. The Mist Shinobi defended the attacks at first, but after some time he also started going offensive. Now, that's fun isn't it? Abito grinned, setting his two flamed kunais to his side, pushing Wind Chakra into them. Of course, after everything happened back in the land of mangroves, he upgraded them. Wind gathered around the kunais before shaping into a sword. It being similar to the wind sword jutsu that the Shimura clan was known for. But the wind blade was much more stable. Now let's dance. Abito moved fast, attacking the mist shinobi. Swords clashing with each other, creating loud noises and sparks. Unlike Abito's wind swords, Zabuza's swords was taking damage. The sparks were part of his broadsword that was chipping away. The mist shinobi couldn't keep this up. He needed to get some distance. And Zabuza found the perfect opening, as he jumped back. Going through signs while he was in air. And surprisingly enough, Abito copied his jutsu, and even casting it a second faster than Zabuza. Water style. Water cutter jutsu. Water style. Water cutter jutsu. Both shinobi spewed water in a straight line at the same time. While Abito could move on the ground, he ran forward avoiding the sharp current of water, but Zabuza was sitting target in air. And Abito's water cutter hit him in air, making him fall to the ground. The arena erupted in a cheer. Seeing one of the contests fall. While all of them were cheering for Abito to win. All of the audience was from the village, and Abito was well known for being a friendly Achiha that helped random villages from time to time. So he was getting a lot of support. Abito of course didn't focus on the audience, he was more interested in his opponent. But he didn't pursue Zabuza, giving the Mist Shinobi time to recover. And why wouldn't he? The moment Abito and Zabuza made eye contact, he had placed the Mist Shinobi on a simple Jinjutsu. Jinjutsu. Puppeteer. Where he could basically suggest Zabuza to what to do next, and he would follow. But from Zabuza's perspective it will be like Abito knew his next move. It was quite the fun trick, and of course, Abito used it better than anyone. When the dust cleared, Zabuza stood up, panting and there was a wound on his left arm, a deep wound, from where blood was gashing out of. The Mist Shinobi wasted no time and used the extra bandages on his body to close the wound. But for the battle, he couldn't use his left arm. Abito didn't attack, he waited as Zabuza patched himself up. On the other hand, he also took the time to slip in the white gloves that he made. The new gloves felt powerful on his hand, as he made a fist with them. Ready for round two, soy boy. Abito grinned, activating his flamed kunai wind blade, while Zabuza readied himself with his large sword, both shinobis moved at the same time, erupting another cheer from the audience. Blades clashed, sparks flew and the fight was quite amazing to watch. More so for the experienced shinobis. But just when Zabuza found an opportunity in Abito's guard and was about to attack it, Abito snapped his fingers, creating red sparks, how are these kids even genin? One of the Kanoha Chunins asked as they watched the match. They fight like experienced fighters. And not to mention the small Ichiha is clearly holding back, he isn't even panting unlike the other. Similar talks were happening among the audience. And of course in the audience, some were from the Ichiha clan, and they felt proud in Abito's performance. For them, Abito was the clan's golden child. Go big bro cheered a kid Shisui, watching the fight. On the upper floors where the cages and daimyo sat, something similar was happening. Hirazan, this Ichiha kid is quite interesting. Said the fire daimyo, as he sipped on his drink. Isn't he rumored to be Kagami's disciple? 
The third Hokage smiled, yes, he is. He nodded, but at the same time he's also the disciple of Yuzumaki Kashina and Minato Namikas. His talent for Fuinjidus is quite amazing, you can expect the unexpected from him. Anoki on his side snorted. The kid's got some skills, I will say that. Well, I couldn't expect anything less from Madara's clan. And he obviously is holding back in the fight, here is an I have to ask, why you didn't promote the kid to join already? The other daimyo nodded. Here is inside, before shrugging, he might be an Achiha, but like Kagami he's different from the rest. He doesn't want ranks or any of that, he more so wants to gain strength and stay in the village. He's still a kid after all. Of course, all of that was just made up bullshit, but the daimyos nodded, while Anoki just rolled his eyes. But then again, his son was also participating in the exams, so he was guilty of the same mistake. Their thoughts were cut off, when they heard a small explosion from the battlefield. Here is inside, before shrugging, he might be in a Chiha, but like Kagami he's different from the rest. He doesn't want ranks or any of that, he more so wants to gain strength and stay in the village. He's still a kid after all. Of course all of that was just made up bullshit, but the daimyos nodded, while Anoki just rolled his eyes. But then again, his son was also participating in the exams, so he was guilty of the same mistake. Their thoughts were cut off, when they heard a small explosing from the battlefield. Did the kid summon a jutsu? A stone daimyo asked, I didn't see him go throughout the hand signs. Hiruzen frowned and looked closely, and it happened again. Right in the middle of the sword fight, Abito threw one of his sword upwards, and with the free hands, snapped his fingers. And a red spark cockered from the gloves before traveling like electricity towards Abusa, creating an explosion right in his face. It seemed Abito is using his new gloves. So that's what's been cocking up for the past week. The Inferno Glvos. I didn't know he could finish those before the exams, let alone in the exams. Minato said from the side, gaining looks from the daimyos. They understood as some shinobi stuff, related to Fuinjutsu, but they were of course impressed. Here is an internally mild, Abito was dragging out the fight to show all of his cards to the people. It was a good choice of him to make Abito this year's trump card. The daimyos were clearly getting impressed, and the dominating swordplay was also impressive. Abito wasn't using any grand jutsus, but maybe he would use them later in the rounds. But then again, the daimyos knew about jutsus, and saw them many times, the new things with the gloves. Back in the battlefield, Zabuza was clearly getting dominated by Abito. While he was getting winded from exhaustion and lightheaded from all the wounds and blood loss, the Ichiha seemed just fine. The Mist Shinobi could see he was outmatched. And he wanted to forfeit. But something in him stopped him from doing that. He didn't know why, he was fighting a losing battle here. And he would die at this rate, and yet he couldn't give up. Abito ducked under Zabuza's huge sword, and used it as a moment as he was trying to get up, he felt a presence on his side and he was too late. Abito punched him on the jaw from his side, breaking a few of his teeth, and making the boy roll to the side. You know the fight was getting a bit boring. So that's why I will just use my fist to beat you, no wind swords, no flashy gloves, just plain old fists. Now that I gave you a fair advantage I hope you can fight. The Achiha already had stored his fond kunai, and now was bouncing on his feet too with his hands in a loose boxing position. Zabuza for the third time stood up, gritting his teeth, or what's left of them. Dodge. With that Abito moved like a blur, and punching the boy on his jaw as he staggered back. Do slow with that the Achiha continued attacking the Mist Shinobi with furry of punches and kicks, each on enough to make a crack on his bones. But Abito of course was holding back quite a lot, unlike other fights he wasn't using his armament gloves that brought damaging effects. No he was using something that was experimental. Abito was a master of strong fist style, learning it from the master himself might die, but he also knew the gentle fist. And now he was using a variant that used both concepts to generate most amount of pain. Each of his punches and kicks were targeted in the general area where the chakra points were located. And unlike the gentle fist, he didn't close them no, he destroyed them. Not only were his attacks breaking bones, rupturing blood vessels and ripping muscles, he was also destroying the chakra points. Making it painful for the mist shinobi to even circulate chakra. He was doing that so he could give the mist shinobi the most amount of pain before killing him. It was very important to kill Zabuza. 
cause not only will he kill of a future enemy, but at the same time, he could gain some of Pakru's trust. The girl might be older than her by a few years. But Abito felt quite saddened by her story. Suna wasn't a very kind place to live for an orphan. And now she had no one. It was a good thing the grand lady took her in. Her scorch style was quite useful. And not to mention she was a skilled shinobi as well. So Abito was just doing his task, killing him by giving him the most amount of pain. Of course, the audience was cheering him on. For them, it didn't look brutal, because most of the damage was internal. But the shinobis in the audience could see it just fine. Let's end this shall we Abito said, as he delivered a punch to the gut, making the mist shinobi fall on him. Zabuza couldn't hold it anymore, and shouted to the announcer to forfeit, but no voice came out. He felt a sharp pain in his throat, and his vocal cord was broken. Abito grabbed the mist shinobi by his hair and made direct eye contact with him. Jinjutsu. Zabuza was wide-eyed as the pain in his body increased dramatically. He could feel every wound on his body, and the pain was so intense that his brain could barely process it. Now to finish it of Abito brought his leg backward before delivering a ferocious kick to Zabuza's groin. Bursting the two eggs with it, as the mist shinobi rolled his eyes and foamed from his mouth before dropping to the floor. The mist shinobi was barely alive, but Abito knew he would die soon. The Jinjutsu that Abito used was quite the potent one, a Jinjutsu that Kagami made himself. And it was known to kill people if they were caught on it, and with his last attack, Zabuza would die soon. The announcer soon came, and kneeled down to Zabuza's body, who was curling up and twitching. He stood up a second later. The winner of the match, Abito Iche. The stadium erupted into a cheer once again, as the medical department rushed in trying to save the missed shinobi. But it was too late, as Abuza died, his last moments were whimpering in pain. The kid's quite amazing. Isn't he? Uriah said, looking at the fight. But man that's cold the last killing blow. He just shook his head. Kids these days seem to get crueler, and crueler Tsunade rolled her eyes. The kid looked bloodthirsty to me you have seen it, haven't you? He was going for the kill with each of his strike, and that's not even adding the fact that he seemed to enjoy his time killing his foe. Really? Another voice said, from their side making both of the Sanans look behind. I didn't know you cared for Shinobis of other villages that much. And being a bit blood trusty isn't bad in my books. It was of course Arachimaru. Jiraiya flatly looked at his friend. In your books, I would be surprised if the word morality existed. Let alone whatever you think. That made the snake summoner chuckle. Anyway, I didn't know you were in Konoha. Don't you have research and all? Learning all the ninjutsu in the world, all that jazz Arachimaru rolled his eyes. At least unlike you I spend my time doing something productive. Oh, did I hurt you feelings, you pale bastard. The snake summoner rolled his eyes again. Why did he even put up with him? Anyway, jokes aside it's nice seeing you. What are doing these days anyway? Some freaky medical research. No, I have found some interest in the Achea. Unlike other members of his clan, he barely uses his bloodline ability, not relying on it. And I find that quite fascinating. Tsunade snorted. Jiraiya as bad as it is. Now my other teammate is into little boys. Oh, how bad the team Saratobi has fallen. Jiraiya couldn't help himself and burst out laughing. Well the snake summoner felt a bit irritated. Maybe it was wrong to pay them a visit. Even though Orochimaru didn't like his teammates per se, they were the only few people that the snake summoner cared about. And not to mention it was Swan's brother's and lover's death that pushed him to look for power. Also unlike Swan Orochimaru knew why Dan died. His years of working under Danzo and en route gave him a supply of information. Information that he didn't like. And it also made him realize how futile human life was. And that's why he was sure his pursuit of immortality was the only way he would survive this cruel world. And he found a technique that might let him do it. But he wasn't sure, and he needed a few people for it to work. People who had potential. And he could see just the one he's been looking for. Even though the three legendary Sanans were watching the exams from a special corner. The Shinobis there felt a bit awkward seeing the interaction between the legendary figures. While this was going on back in the stadium, a redeated girl was looking down a corpse. She was kneeling down near it, before she put the cloth back over the body's face. So he died. She said sadly. Of course, she was none other than Mei. Being groomed to be the next in line to become the Mizukage. 
even though there was another boy similar to her age that was competing for the position. Who cares about him anyways he was weak and that's why he lost, Kissam said, who was standing at the doorway. And he had multiple chances of giving up, even he was your comrade and teammate, at least act that you miss him she growled, Zabuza might not be the best, but he was still part of the village. And you should care about that. Kissam didn't say anything, just looked elsewhere. He wasn't going to lie, he didn't feel great either that one of his teammates died. And he did know Zabuza for the longest time, they bonded well having similarities in savagery. Don't worry. You go back to the Mizukich. Kissam said, after a bit of a pause. We might not be able to reverse the damage. But the next match is between me and the girl that's Ichiha's teammate. And I will make an example out of her. You do that, then Mei said, fury in her eyes. Tell the world that we missed Shinobis are better than some tree huggers. Kissam gave her a savage grin. Going towards the arena, he would show them all right. Rin on her end was reading herself. She was quite worried, even more so after doing some research on her next opponent. Kiss him. The boy was a prodigy of the mist. Even better than Zabuza. She wondered if she could defeat her. A pit was forming in her stomach. She was mainly a water-style user. But she was going to fight an opponent that would be clearly better than her in terms of Jutsus. Abito's battle was one-sided. But she wasn't like him could see pull it off. Several other questions ran into her head. Just when she was thinking about it. Abito came in her view. Oh, I was looking for you the Ichiha said, so I have to ask you for a favor. The girl blinked. That was first. Usually, she was the one asking him for favors. Sure, ask away ya, yeah. it's simple really Abito said, you have to kill your next opponent. The girl blinked again, several times. I I but Abito cut her off, acting as if he didn't see her hesitate. I know killing isn't your thing and not to mention, I can't say this sort of stuff in front of Guy. But I really need to shark boy dead. So will you do it for me? He said, extending his hand towards him. She could see it, unlike her. Abito had confidence in her ability. The Achiha really thought better of her didn't she so she couldn't underperform. No, she will live up to the expectations. A surge of confidence boiled up in her, and she said it, okay, I will do it. With that she grabbed onto his hand, while the Achiha gave a broad smile. Are the contestants ready? Both Rin and Kissam nodded. While Kissam wore a simple mist armor, Rin wore her battle gear created by Abito, and her face was covered by a mask, while her head was covered by a hoodie. Let the match begin. The announcer said disappearing from his spot. But unlike the previous match, the contestants moved immediately toward each other. While Rin took to the distance, throwing Kunain's a kissum, the shark boy was trying to get near her, with his huge sword in hand. Rin knew better than to test her sword skills against an opponent like Kissum. So she opted for the long-distance approach. Keeping her distance and taking shots with her kunais and shurikens. For the first few minutes, it was a game of cat and mouse. Kissam was trying to get near Rin, while the Kanoha Shinobi was trying her best to keep their distance. Stop running you damn coward. Kissam grunted as he tried to gain near her again. He was easily able to deflect the shurikens and kunais that Kissam thrown at her, making the whole battlefield filled with weapons. But what the Mist Shinobi didn't know was that was her plan all along. Kissam saw a chance and made a leap, trying to slash at his opponent. But much to his surprise, he felt a glow from underneath his feet, and boom. An explosion occurred, creating a smoke screen. Rin didn't stand by and threw a few more explosive kunyas at the shark boy. Creating an explosion, as she got away from her spot, sanding a few meters away from the smoke. The audience and even the daimyos were a bit bored when the fight started. It seemed less a fight, more of a chase. But now, after seeing the girl's clever tactic, they knew this match would be interesting. Rin stood her guard, even while she was quite far from Kissam's presumed location. And right when she was about to get a bit near, her instincts kicked in, telling her of the danger. She didn't wait a moment, as she rolled forward, missing a sharp water stream aimed right at her. Cutting the ground and the outer wall of the ring with it. When the smoke cleared, she could see it. Kissam didn't take any damage. No, he was surrounded by a ball of water. Water prison jutsu and defended himself from the other thrown explosive kunais with the water around him. The bubble of water dispersed, and Kissam came out, uninjured and smiling. The shark was mad nonetheless. Well, 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 you tree-huggers aren't just talk after all, and you girly sure were hiding some skills. 
he said, looking at the battlefield. With a bunch of thrown kunais and shurikens in the ground, he knew all of them could be a possible trap. So she wasn't just randomly throwing things around. Rin didn't say anything, focusing on the fight. Her face was unreadable underneath her mask, but she was biting her lower lip in frustration. She wanted to end the match fast, not only because she had way less chakra than the Mist Shinobi, but that she also would need to conserve her strength if she wanted to move on to the next rounds. Her mind went over all the possible seniors. And way to use all of the jutsus in her arsenal. Her palms were sweaty, her breathing was erratic, yet she didn't feel nervous, no she felt excited. She had been training rigorously with prodigies for months now. And when you train with them, the talent eventually rub off on you. Wait. That sounded wrong. The crowd of course didn't cheer for anyone outside their village. But at the same time all of them were impressed with Kisum's jutsu. Though some of the shinobis that saw the second round, still, they were impressed with the sheer amount of chakra the boy had. What though the daimyos in the arena were surprised about the sheer amount of the jutsu. They quickly looked at the Mizukage. It seems that the mist has some very talented individuals. One of them said. The third Mizukage didn't say anything but nodded with a smile. Even I have to say I'm impressed, it was Minato who spoke, but I wouldn't give the boy credit, just yet Hiruzen was internally surprised at the confidence in Minato towards his student. But he felt a bit of familiarity in it. In his time teaching the legendary Sanans he often got those types of feelings. Feeling pride in your student strength. Huh. He was getting old, wasn't here and saw the water wave coming her way, and she smiled. Her plan was working. She didn't want to fall behind and ran through hand signs of her own. A simple jutsu that she had practiced quite a lot since her training with Kishina. Lighting style. Thunder arrow jutsu. Blue arcs of electricity came out of her hands as she pointed at Kissam and attacked the shark boy. The boy was taken aback and got electrocuted while he was using his water jutsu. And he couldn't even avoid it either, the water conducting the electricity towards him. By now Kissam's water jutsu was almost finished, even though he was attacked at the last moment. Still, the water was enough for the stadium to be submerged into two meters deep. And Kissam getting a bit paralyzed from the shock sunk into the small pool of water. Also, he was a bit exhausted that he had to use one third of his chakra for that jutsu, though he still had enough left in the tank. Rin didn't wait for the boy to get up. Going through another set of hand signs. Even while she saw the huge wave of water, she didn't stop. Her lighting style wasn't good as Kakashi's, no it was far, she said, placing a hand over the water. With a burst of smoke a giant calm reviled itself, while Rin was on top of it. Tanking all the water with its shell, as it floated above water. Impossible. Mei said wide-eyed looking at the calm. How can Kanoha Shinobi have clam summoners? Even the third Mizukage was surprised. Only the Hazuki clan was known to be the summoners of those animals. Even their previous cage was one of their summoners. But it was surprising it was Anoki who spoke, the little man looked rather amused. Do you really think the summoning clans of the clams only bond to the Hazuki clan of yours? They aren't anything special you know the short man snorted. They are any other summoning clan for the matter, seek out the strongest and most talented warriors to become their partners, that just means that she has talented enough to gain their attention. That Tsuchikage smiled, he didn't like the Hazuki clan, and because of them he had lost his teacher Mew. And that's why he was very happy that the damn clam clan was having summoners outside the mist village. The third Mizukage on the other hand had had a bit of suspicion against the Hazuki and Yuki clan of his village. Not to mention that the clan's insides were trying to create a civil war against him, so he only felt frustration in the situation. Hiruzen had a similar idea, but he didn't speak of it. One of his students did something similar with his summon, so it wasn't that surprising. Minato was a bit surprised, but he didn't speak anything of it. Gaining the trust of a summoning animal wasn't something easy. And once they trusted their summoner, they would loyal to him or her. But he was a bit worried though he did trust her student. Summoning Judas. With a burst of smoke, a giant calm reviled itself, while Rin was on top of it. What can I do for you Lady Rin? Asked the giant clam. It was light purple in color with a white shine over it. It looked quite beautiful. Lady Ru please help me fight against my enemy, Rin said, before explaining to the giant clam what she needed to do. Hissam who finally got rid of the paralysis effect from the lightning release, saw the giant clam from under the water. 
and summoned his own sharks for his aid. A dozen of killer sharks were summoned, but before they could even get near the clam, they started winching in pain, and didn't follow the orders. It was then Kissam felt his own skin burn as well, his eyes, burning as well, as if everything around him was fire, iron icily, while being under the water. Kissam had a good head above his shoulder and gritted through the pain. Him thinking it was some kind of jinjutsu. The shark boy quickly got out of the water, and swallowed a soldier pill, calming his nerves down. Now that he was above water, he forced one of his eyes open. Just in the nick of time to see, getting attacked by two water whips that were targeted at him. He deflected the first one barely, while the second one hit him in the back, forcing him to get some distance away in the water stadium. Bitch I'm going to kill you. He said, trying to get near, but the attacks kept coming, making him take distance from the Kanoha Shinobi. As he dodged and deflected, he saw something from the corner of his eye and he was shocked when he saw his sharks float in the water. Dead, but that wasn't all. Their bodies were sizzling as if they were burning in liquid acid. So that wasn't Jinjutsu after all. The mist shinobi cursed his bad luck. Kissum winched a bit when he found some splashed of water jet on his skin. The acid wasn't that strong yet, as he was quite far from the giant clam. Still it burned. With how things went, he wouldn't even be able to plant his feet on the water anymore his sandals getting melted due to the acidity. But that wasn't all, his vision was getting blurry as well. Maybe the acid water got to his eyes. Kissam didn't bother to stay on the water, and quickly made way towards the boundary, getting his feet planted on the wall. There were a few erected earth formations in the stadium, where he could find ground, but they could be easily be destroyed with Rin's water whip jutsu. That's why the shark boy planted his feet firmly on the stadium wall. He was still getting attacked by the water whip, but now that he was in the boundary, he could avoid it. Though he couldn't attack from that far. The dual water whips were thrown at him, and he wondered how much stamina the girl had. The water whip jutsu wasn't that chakra consuming, it depended on the level of chakra control. And not to mention the fact that she had been pushing herself physically, with her teammates being tojutsu monsters. Kissum clicked his tounge dodging another water whip. Bitch, I'm not ving up, until I kill you. The shark boy said, using all the remaining chakra he had to perform another jutsu. Even though he wasn't good at using other elements he was decent at it. And not to mention, if he could build a platform with earth, maybe he could attack the Kanoha Kanoichi. But just when he was going to finish the jutsu. The injury from his back flared up. And he stopped, basically paralyzed. A sick feeling was in his stomach. Don't tell me her attacks with the water whips were poison liaised. Yes, it was poison liaised. In fact, a particularly common poison used in shinobi battles, that after getting poisoned with would only spread out its effect when the victim used any medium to big scale jutsu. He couldn't even say another thing as his paralyzed body fell on the acid water. And started getting burned. After a few seconds of showing no movement, the announcer declared the winner. And told Rin to get rid of the water. Rin's clam summon was quick to oblige and suck the water into its body. Before puffing away. But it was too late. Like the sharks, Kissam's body was unrecognizable. He had not only burned on the outside because of the acid, but also from the inside as well. He did drown in a pool of acid for a minute or so. Even though Rin had won the match. Not many cheered for her. The civilians were a bit disgusted at the horrifying sight of the dead body. Even though it was a win, she felt a bit shaken receiving such looks from the audience. Yet she flared up when she saw a certain red head in the stadium, with a bandana and a flag cheering for her. Now she felt embarrassed. Her new sensei could be too much sometimes. And she wasn't alone, a few of her friends from the stadium started cheering her on. And in a snowball effect, the crowd erupted in a cheer sure they just witnessed the horrifying sight of someone getting boiled alive in acid. But at least it wasn't one of their own villages that died in the stadium. And there would a war starting soon. So they took it as a great sign the fighters form their villagers aren't the one to die. Because in war, most of the casualties and rapes were on civilians. So they didn't seem to that put of by the act. On the upper floors, Arachimaru whistled. You know, maybe I should take young Rin under my team as well. She has a good knack for poisons the snake summoner mused. Duraya shrugged his shoulder. I don't know if Minato would part with that last the last thing I know, even Kashina was training her. Though, I have mixed feelings about this fight. It was impressive, but it just felt wrong. 
Wait, did you mean the red habanero Kashina is training her? Sunate asked. In relation, she was her cousin after all. And she was a bit surprised. She wasn't partially close to her. But still, after her going away from the village. Anyone would point at the Yuzumaki to be the strongest female in Konoha. So she respected that. Though her students seemed a bit dark for her liking. Not knowing what would happen later, and would you look at that the red devil herself. Uriah deadpanned, before pointing at a corner in the stadium, where a red head was cheering on over Rin's victory. And yup it was Kashina Yuzumaki. Arachimaru chuckled. The fight wasn't the usual fight but a practical one. Even I have to say this girl was clever. Sunade nodded. Though, I would rather not see unneeded killing. Arachimaru raised an eyeball. You don't get it do you the snake summoner shook his head. There was a huge gap between her and her opponent. She was obviously outmatched, so he just outsmarted it. Simple as that. I for one time agree with Arachimaru on this one, Jiraiya said, getting raised eyebrows from both of the Sanans. It doesn't mean that I agree with her taking things to the extreme, though he cleared. Sunade raised an eyebrow. Go on Jiraiya started. You see little Rin here picked up the sword only a month ago, so she was quite clever, not engaging the mist shinobus in a bladed battle, when her opponent had a clear advantage in skill and experience. He said, rubbing his chin, then she also might have seen that her opponent like her mostly focused on water release, so she used the lightning release to catch the shark boy off guard, still she had way less chakra than him. And so she went of the route and used things that she never used, like poison or acid. The acid pool was a great idea that her summon could pull of. And the paralysis poison is kinda common, but the way she used it was unique, I might say. Using poison with water whips she really has good control over her chakra. Most people would wash away the poison without control. Arachimaru nodded. Yes, even after using that foolish water jutsu, the boy had more than double the chakra of that girl. The mist brat was clearly strong, more chakra, more killing experience, and yet he was outsmarted. Jiraiya nodded again. You know if she's nurtured she might become one of the best battle tacticians in Konoha. He said, while he and the snake summoner both looked at Tsunade. Promoting the blonde to raise an eyebrow. So what you want me take her under my wing or something? She snorted. Well, even though Arachimaru and me are both battle smarts here we both know our shortcoming. We are more instant-minded, making quick, yet, rash decisions, sometimes awarding us, other times biting us the ass while the girl Jiraiya said, jabbing his thumb towards Rin. Is more like you plans ahead a lot. What might happen? What might go wrong? What could and couldn't be used? She practically read her opponent like a book there. Same way, you did with Granny Chio remember? Having any and all combination of antidotes prepared, if she came up with new ones, she's kinda like you on that department. Tsunade squinted her eyes. So what do you want me to do? Teach her. Hone her skills, so that she might become an outstanding shinobi. Make her my future legacy of some sort, like how you did with the blonde Namika's kid. Jiraiya felt a bit shrunken down. But he didn't back down. He wanted her back in the village. Like old times, gathering around, bickering about stupid stuff and the like so he answered. Why yeah. Sunade fumed with anger and slammed her fist onto the nearest pillar of the wall. Yet it didn't make any sound, still, the building shook as if an earthquake hit it. The shinobis that were even near the conversation between the three Sanans, started, getting nervous. She didn't release any chakra, even with the anger she displayed. No, it was pure killing intent, that would suffocate any normal shinobi. Like I would do that for a village that killed of Dan. The village that couldn't protect Nawaki or my own grandfathers. To hell with this village for what I care. She said, grunting out of the room, I need a drink for this one she mumbled to herself as she went away. The snake summoner and the toad summoner stood there awkwardly a bit. So she found out, eh? Jiraiya sighed, with his shoulder down. Arachimaru didn't look quite as downed as him, still, he was a bit sad. The snake summoner had always blamed himself for Tswan's brother's death. Though he wasn't that surprised that she figured out that Dan was killed off by the village. It was more of the fault of the political situation at the time. Still, why send a good shinobi to die off just cause he followed his orders differently? Dan being killed by the village only makes me certain that most of the time the dear sensei of ours doesn't know how to run the village properly. Arachimaru said, something similar was going to happen to Sakumo as well, if it wasn't stopped by Kagami. 
The snake summoner hated a few of the cowardly decisions the Kanoha councils took, and it was one of them. Though he had his doubts that Danzo had some involvement in both of the incidents. Even though it didn't logically make sense, he had a hunch on that one. Anyway, he didn't like how things went back then. He had seen how bad it affected her teammate firsthand. And even though Orochimaru didn't have that much morality in him. He still kept Uraya could only sigh and nod. Sometimes he truly wondered if he should have taken up a sit and fired half of the Kanoha council to just make it up for Tsunade. He knew that the Senju princess didn't act out because of the underlying love for the village. Still, there was burning hatred for it as well. But he wouldn't back down, he would change her heart if it's the last thing he did. On the cage's side of the room. The girl truly is talented. Not only smart, but also knows when to take the necessary steps. The fire daimyo said, while a few others nodded. Even though for the general public, the fight might seem brutal. But for the daimyos, they needed guards that not only protected them, but would be up to the gruesome tasks if needed. And with so many assassination attempts on their lives. They often sought out young talents for their bodyguard positions. And a few of the daimyos had her in their mind. Unintentionally Rin had gained a lot of favors in the short moment. Even without knowing about it. Rin seemed not like the average cold-blooded killer to them, and also they could see the boldness of her decision-making. Taking the steps necessary to get the job done. The Mizukage was disappointed. He felt that he had lost face coming to the exam. He should have not come to the exams, like the other two cages if he knew that his fighters were this incapable. And he did, but on his side, a red-haired girl was furious as to what happened to kiss him. And she would remember the Kanoha Koichi for what she did. Anoki seemed to get sick pleasure out of the situation. And even didn't try to hide it. Cackling with laughter when he saw how the fight ended. Well the Hokage was a bit worried as to how child or their age was so adept at killing. But the bad situation they were in, he knew in this war, they might need to send young Genins to the front lines as well. It only reminded him of the failures he had done. Minato had a bit of mixed feelings about the fight. But he was impressed by his student nonetheless. She really did improve in this small time, and he was proud of that. Rin walked backstage and was surprised to see Kakashi. She wasn't expecting him to meet her first. So how are you feeling the masked boy spoke. Uh exhausted, I guess. Rin said, but at least I won Kakashi nodded, before walking towards her, putting a hand on his shoulder. I was a bit concerned about your first kill and all, but it seems that you are fine Rin flinched a bit, honestly she didn't know how to feel about the whole ordeal. She only killed because Abita requested her to. But as the fight went on, it became obvious that if she didn't kill, she would end up dying instead. Because fighting to win and fighting to kill are vastly different, she even wondered if that's why Abito told her to kill the shark boy. It made sense in a way. Anko had told her about the Mist Shinobi corning them in the forest, only for Abito to get there and stop the fighting from even beginning. And Abito wasn't someone that would interfere in things, unless anyway, I'm sure others are also waiting to congratulate you Kakashi said, smiling a bit under the mask. Breaking the girl out of her thoughts. The boy was rather cold to mostly everyone, except a few. Rin being around Kakashi most her life, bonded well as friends. And she felt a bit glad that he didn't think any less of her using that kind of tactics to win. It pumped up her even more, to reach new heights with her skills. He thanked the boy, as both of them made their way towards the waiting room. There she was greeted by Guy and Abido. Who were in some kind of argument about something something about summoning clothes. The Kashi coughed, grinding both of their attention to them. Oh, look who's back. Abito said, grinding. You know I was supposed to show of Kanoha's might to the daimyos, being a showstopper and all the jazz. But at this rate you might give me a competition. Kakashi snorted. As if you don't like being challenged. Abito just stuck his tongue out towards the boy. You're no fun Rin guy spoke, giving her a thumbs up. I'm really glad that you won the match so, you didn't think I would. Rin said, throwing the boy off. No no that's not what I meant. He said, stumbling a bit. You know he seemed quite strong, I wasn't even sure if I would've came out uninjured while fighting him, but you did. That's really admirable. And that passion for improvement is very youthful. Rin was dazed a bit. Now that he mentioned it, she really was uninjured though, she was exhausted beyond her capacity. And felt a bit out of her place for the next matches to come. She almost prayed that it wasn't one of her teammates. 
Though, she also wanted to test out herself as well. Anyway, wish me luck. I said, grinning with his fist tightened. That was when she realized that the next match was of his green spandex wearing friend. And his opponent was none other than a Yuzumaki that was called a prodigy. Kenshi was no easy opponent, even though she could read others' chakra, being skilled with chakra and all. She still lacked the skills and art of chakra sensing. Yet she knew that Kenshi was a big deal. His chakra pool was even larger than Kisum's. Heck, she wasn't sure she had ever seen chakra of that size except for Kashina's. Kakashi's couldn't even hold a candle to it. And Guy was going against him. A boy that specialized in Tajutsu, cause of his lacking talent in ninjutsu on paper, it was obvious who would win. Yet she believed otherwise. I know you can win this Rin said, seeing Guy going towards the stadium. She knew the odds were against his friend. Yet, she knew how skillful he, so would he. She also felt elated, that if Guy won, then all three of Team Minato would go to the finals. Guy didn't look back as he walked to the stage. Abito had warned him of Kenshi. And even he had a keen eye to know that taking him on, wouldn't be an easy task. While well, Guy was only 10 years old, Kenshi was 12. And was a prodigy since birth. Not to mention that he was clan heir no more like a village heir. And he would fight against him. This might be the toughest fight yet. And yet, he wasn't nervous no he was delighted by the challenge. All the years of hard work, he would show it off here. Both the shinobis stood opposite to each other. Sizing up the other. It's an honor to fight you. Guy said. Kenshi didn't say anything. He looked unimpressed, as if he was a bother to him. Guy knew that look. It was a look of boring. I and Kenshi stood opposite each other, as the audience cheered for both of the shinobis. Even though Kenshi was from another village, Kanoha favored the Yuzumaki village greatly. And also, Guy was a clanless shinobi. So there was also a bit of skepticism mixed in the audience. But both of the contestants didn't focus there. No, but they were more concerned about the fight. While Guy knew his opponent was strong, due to basic info gathering, Kenshi didn't. Still, the boy felt a bit off by the green spandex wearing man. It's not like I will lose to him or anything Kenshi thought to himself. He's just a clanless kid the arena was fixed after the fight between Rin and Kissam, that's why the match started a bit late. Now the arena is flat ground, with several earth pillars erected from the ground, so that one could get the high ground if needed. Kenshi slowly drew his blade, while Guy took out his nunchucks. Both shinobis eyed each other, before all of a sudden they moved. Clashing right in the middle of the arena. The speed was fast, making all of the cheerings in the arena stop, as they looked at the battle with interest and awe. While Guy was fast, it soon became obvious that Kenshi was the faster one here. And Guy had to opt for fleeing from his attacks. Well, what else do you expect from an Yuzumaki prodigy one of the shinobis from the gallery said. Still, the poor kid is putting up a good match he didn't get injured yet. Kakashi, who was near the shinobi, couldn't help but shake his head a bit. He didn't say anything, just focused on the match. Guy found a chance, and smashed the ground with his nunchucks, creating a dust cloud. And he took several steps back, before going up one of the earth pillars. You are really powerful, aren't you Guy said, standing on the earth pillar, looking down towards his opponent. It seems I can't hold back much suddenly Kenshi felt a bit of dread. Guy removed his weights from his hands and legs, tossing them below, while getting a few surprised glances from the audience. The weights fell on the ground, creating a large dust cloud and a crater. Leaving the audience in awe. He was fighting at that speed with those weights on. Was the common thought echoing in the audience. That won't change the outcome, Leaf Shinobi. Kenshi said, gripping his sword hard, focusing on his opponent. But then the green spandex wearing Shinobi disappeared from his sight. His image fading away from his spot. On your right. And she sucked forward, barely missing the nunchucks that were aimed at his head. But Kenshi couldn't keep his eye on Guy as the Kanoha Shinobi disappeared. Guy called out from above as he attacked again, calling out and Kenshi barely dodging or blocking the attacks. On your right. Kenshi called out yet again. And she quickly blocked with his sword towards his right, only for the strike to come from the left. Sending the Yuzumaki Shinobi shot out from his spot like a bullet, hitting the arena wall in the process. For a while, no one spoke, before the audience broke in a cheer. They were very surprised that even a clanless shinobi in Kanoha could keep up with a Yuzumaki clan prodigy. Rin on the other hand looked towards Abito with disbelief. 
you corrupted the green boy Abito burst out laughing. Even I didn't think he would pull out a cheap trick like that it seems he finally sees the greatness of my ways. You really are a crafty one Kenshi said with annoyance, as he got up from his crater. He couldn't believe that he fell for that cheap trick. A small trace of blood that he wiped it off with his hand. Even though for normal shinobis it would have broken a few bones, the Yuzumakis were a different case. With having strong bodies that could tank attacks. Guy just smiled. Well, it's like my good friend said. We are shinobis, not samurais he said, smiling before moving fast towards the Yuzumaki. But this time the redhead anticipated his attack, and blocked it. Countering with his own, as blade and nunchucks collided, creating loud sounds, and cloud dust in its way. HMPH is that the best you have got. The Yuzumaki said, using his sword with one hand, while his other hand ran through seals. Then, I will show something new unlike how the Yuzumaki expected a surprised expression, Guy only gave him a raised eyebrow. But it didn't matter he didn't want to use it, as it drains much of his stamina. He wanted to use this technique in his next round. But that he finished making one-handed hand signs water started gathering around the Yuzumaki's blade as he attacked, making the attacks far more deadly. Guy was avoiding each slash with ease just a moment ago, but found it hard now. The water wasn't just gathering around Kenshi's blade, not it was creating a small air over Kenshi's body as well. You should be honored that a clanless mutt like yourself made me use this technique he said, swift style. Red Demon Dance. The water that coated around Kenshi's body gained a tint of red, as his sword strikes got deadlier and faster. And before Guy could counter, the Kanoha Shinobi was kicked in the gut, making him fly off to the sky. Let's end this Kenshi said, gathering water chakra in his sword. While his other hand ran through a few hand signs. Swift style. Demonic water wave, let's end this Kenshi said, gathering water chakra in his sword. While his other hand ran through a few hand signs. Swift style. Demonic water wave a crescent shaped red water blade shot out from Kenshi's blade, as he struck in a horizontal pattern towards Guy, who was still up in air. The flying water blade was fast, but what Kenshi didn't expect was from Guy to kick the air, and dodge his attack at the last moment. And Guy didn't touch the ground either, staying up in air, as he kicked the air to stay afloat. And his position made the whole arena stop in silence as to not believing what they saw, before they burst out cheering. It seems I can't hold back either Guy said, as he got to the ground, placing his nunchucks in front of him. He didn't want to abuse his gates either as he wanted to reserve stamina for the next rounds. But it seems that he will have to use it a bit. Also from his sizing up Kenshi, Guy knew the red-headed boy was sturdy, and he would need to use a bit of his strength, if he wanted to finish him quickly. Kenshi didn't sit still to let his opponent power up, and move towards his enemy with his sword out. First gate of opening and second gate of healing open. All Kenshi saw was a green blur, by instinct he moved his blade to the front trying to block the attack. But it crumbled as it made contact with Guy's nunchucks, before striking him in the chest, knocking the wind out of him as he was thrown off. The water layer around him had cushioned the blow, yet it was quite painful. But Guy knew that it wouldn't finish the job, so he stepped on the ground ten times, Saru, appearing right in front of Kenshi, and delivering a kick to his chin as he was thrown above. Guy wasn't finished there and followed Kenshi with his air walk, Geppo, and attacking him with a fury of sticks with his blunt weapon. Each strike was targeted around joints to make sure that the Yuzumaki didn't get up. Guy finished it off with a spinning axe kick to the back of his head, that sent Kenshi to the ground, making a crater and creating a dust cloud. When the dust cleared it became obvious that Kenshi was knocked out. The poor boy might be a prodigy, but against Guy's hard work he didn't stand a chance. The audience couldn't believe the one-sided beatdown, that the so-called Yuzumaki heir, took at the hands of Guy. There was a brief moment of silence before the crowd burst out cheering. Why wouldn't they, for they had just witnessed the birth of the strongest Dejutsu user in Konoha. When Kenshi opened his eyes he saw an unfamiliar ceiling he lost. He couldn't believe it how could he but his chain of thought was broken by someone. Oh, you are awake. Said one nurse, getting up from his chair. I will bring your teammates here. With that she left the room. It left him back to his thinking. But for some reason rather than feeling sad and defeated, he felt rather relieved. He had never been challenged before back in the village. No one that was near his age couldn't keep up with him. 
Mike Guy, a boy that was younger than him, not only challenged him, but also defeated him. He clearly didn't expect that. Yet he welcomed it. Unlike his father he didn't want to be a frog in a well. That's why he suddenly visited Konoha in the Chunin exam. By rank he was already a Chunin in Yuzushi Agakur, but it seems that major villages had gems hidden inside of them. It also made him think Minato was a similar case. The boy had no clan, yet he had managed to decipher the flying thunder god Jutsu. Maybe Abito was right. It made him think about what Abito said. Konoha really was different. Even though the Yuzumaki village was quite friendly, it still had its flaws. Some of their approaches were a bit discriminating against that lower members of their clan. Often putting them in front lines and unfavorable positions in the battlefield. It apparently became obvious that it was mainly the reason why they started fleeing from their own village. But as the next clan heir he tried to ignore that thinking that pure-blooded Yuzumakis were better than the rest. But it seems that their ways might be the wrong one. Mito Yuzumaki, the wife of the first Hokage, was against how the Yuzumakis were doing things. It seems that she might be right. Konoha was no exception either, Kenshi knew about some of the discriminating laws of Konoha against the Ichihas. Yet, he didn't see any bitterness in him. In fact there were rumors that, he might be trained to be the next Hokage candidate well that was after Minato or Rachimaru. That reminded him both of them were also civilian. Ken. Two red-headed twins said at the same time. How long was I out? Kenshi said. He couldn't be out for that long. Emio seemed a bit reluctant. The exam isn't finished yet. We are in the last match it's against Abito and Momoka was interpreted when they heard the announcer start the last match. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.